This happened to me a few years back when I was working as a ranch hand up in Montana. Tough gig, but it paid the bills, and I loved the wide open spaces and the feeling of being close to nature. My name's Wyatt, by the way. City folk might romanticize ranching, but most days it's about mending fences, herding cows, and trying not to die of boredom. That all changed one hot July afternoon. I was riding the boundary fence on my trusty old quarter horse when I saw it, a massive set of tracks marring the soft earth. Wolf, maybe? Seemed awfully big, even for a wolf. Whatever it was, it had crossed the fence line, heading deeper into the ranch's vast grasslands. Curiosity got the better of me, and I decided to track it down. Dumbest decision of my life. The tracks led me away from the main ranch into a rolling badlands area pockmarked with ravines and scrubby vegetation. The sun beat down, turning my hat into an oven. I kept thinking about heading back, about how much trouble old man Harrison, the ranch owner, would give me if I got caught slacking. But something pulled me forward, the lure of figuring out what kind of creature left those tracks. I followed the trail into a shallow ravine, the walls closing in around me. The tracks were fresh here, barely an hour old, maybe less. That's when I heard it, a growl rumbling low in my chest, sending chills down my spine. I scanned the ravine walls, rifle drawn, but I saw nothing. The growling started again, closer this time, followed by the sound of something large snapping a branch. Then the creature charged. It lunged from a crevice I hadn't even noticed, barreling toward me. It was like a wolf, but taller and broader. It moved on two legs, thick, dark fur barely hiding the rippling muscles beneath. Its head was wolf-like, but the jaw was longer. The eyes burned with a chilling, predatory intelligence. A monstrous snarl ripped from its throat, exposing rows of sharp teeth. I fired, emptying the lever-action rifle in a frenzy. The shots smacked into the creature, but it barely faltered. It leapt toward me, and I felt the impact as its claws raked across my chest, tearing into flesh and fabric. Pain seared through me, bright and agonizing. I went down hard, the rifle flying from my fingers. The creature loomed over me. Its breath stank of blood and rot. I scrabbled with my good arm, searching desperately for the hunting knife sheathed at my hip. The creature lunged, its teeth an inch from my face. And then, a gunshot cracked through the air. The creature jolted, rearing back with a roar of pain. Old man Harrison burst into the ravine, double-barreled shotgun in hand. His weathered face was pale, his eyes wide with terror. He fired again, and the creature staggered backwards, turning and scrambling up the ravine wall with surprising agility. Harrison rushed to my side, helping me sit up. My shirt was soaked in blood, my vision blurring. Hellfire, kid! What were you thinking? He barked, but there was a tremor in his voice. I don't know. I choked out through the pain. It felt like my insides were on fire. He tore up his own shirt and pressed it to my wounds. His grip on my arm was unsteady. We both knew my injuries were bad, real bad. It's gonna get dark soon, he muttered, more to himself than me. We gotta get back, if we can. I doubted we'd make it back, but there was something else in his weathered eyes, something deeper than fear. We stumbled out of the ravine, the sun dipped below the horizon, casting long, ominous shadows across the badlands. Harrison helped me onto my horse, but the world swam before my eyes, fading into blackness. I remember the rocking motion, the old man's gruff voice urging me to hang on, but by then, the pain had me firmly in its grip. I woke up in a hospital bed days later. IVs snaking into my arms and the pungent smell of disinfectant stinging my nostrils. Miraculously, I'd survived. Harrison had gotten me back to the ranch somehow and gotten me to a doctor in time. I barely remember anything after that ravine. The nurses gave me painkillers and told me to rest. But I couldn't rest. That creature, 
those eyes. It was burned into my memory. The doctors gave Harrison the credit for saving my life, and sure, they weren't wrong, but they didn't know. They didn't see what I saw. They wouldn't believe it anyway. They called it an animal attack. Mountain lion, maybe. But the ragged claw marks across my body told a different story. Harrison came by my hospital room, bringing news of the ranch and carefully avoiding the subject altogether. His eyes held a grim truth. He knew what lurked in the Badlands. I spent weeks in that hospital, then weeks more healing at home. The pain dulled to a persistent ache, but the scars across my chest throbbed, a constant reminder of my brush with death. I should have been relieved, grateful, but instead a hollow fear gnawed at my insides. I hadn't seen the creature since that day in the ravine, but I knew it was still out there. Nightmares stole my sleep. In fevered dreams I was hunted through the badlands, the creature's eyes burning in the darkness. I'd wake in a cold sweat, my heart hammering like a trapped bird against my ribs. The doctors gave me some pills, said it was anxiety, but medication couldn't silence the knowledge that something monstrous lurked just beyond the ranch's borders. Once I was healed enough to get around, Harrison hired me back on. He looked more weathered, older than when I had left. Over evening meals in the ranch cookhouse, he'd tell me about the day's work as if nothing had happened. But every once in a while, his gaze would drift to the window, to the darkness beyond. Fear flickered in those eyes. One crisp autumn morning, a month or so after my return, I was mending a fence near the Badlands when I heard it. The same terrifying growl. I froze, the hammer falling from my numb fingers. The creature had found me. It stepped from the scrub, its hulking form dwarfing the surrounding vegetation. In the stark sunlight, I saw it with horrifying clarity. Its fur was matted and coarse, the color of dried blood and shadows. Its teeth gleamed, each one a wicked knife. And those eyes, they held the same terrifying intelligence, the same cold malice. My survival instincts kicked in. I dropped my tools and ran. There's no point in romanticism. I knew I was dead. Nothing outruns a predator on its own turf, but some blind, primal part of me hoped for a miracle. I ran until my lungs threatened to burst, until my scars pulsed in white-hot agony. And the whole time, the snarls and crashing footsteps of the creature pursued me, echoing my terror. I stumbled tripping over a hidden rock and slamming into the hard earth. Pain flared from my ankle. I tried to scramble back up, but it was useless. I lay there, my breath heaving in ragged gasps, waiting for death. And then, a different sound cut through the air. Gunshots, a familiar staccato rhythm. Harrison, once again charging to my rescue. He erupted from a cluster of rocks, shotgun blazing. The creature hesitated, not in fear, but in cold calculation. Then, with a final snarl that echoed in my bones, it turned and disappeared back into the unforgiving landscape. Harrison reached me, his face a mask of strained relief. He helped me to my feet, supporting me as we limped back to the ranch. Neither of us spoke, the silence heavy with the unspoken knowledge of what roamed the wilds. Can't stay here no more, Wyatt. Harrison said later that evening. His weather-beaten face was creased in a mix of worry and defeat. I nodded, not trusting my voice. He was right. We couldn't fight this thing. We couldn't live with the constant dread of when it might attack again. The ranch sold a few weeks later. It went to some big oil company that wanted the drilling rights. Harrison packed his bags and headed south, muttering something about retiring to Arizona. I loaded my meager belongings into a beat-up old truck and drove west. I didn't stop until I reached the Pacific Ocean. Life went on, kind of. I found odd jobs, lived a transient life, never staying in one place for too long. The nightmares faded, dulled by the passage of time, but the weight of what I'd seen never truly left me. I avoided forests and mountains, stuck to crowded city streets 
where you could convince yourself, maybe, that the only monsters were the human kind. Sometimes, standing on a bustling sidewalk or riding a crowded subway car, I imagine I catch a flash of yellow eyes in the crowd or see a hulking shape move in the shadows at the edge of my vision. Panic surges through me, and I have to push down the urge to scream, to run, to escape a threat that may no longer exist. People say the Dogman is a myth, a campfire story. Old Man Harrison is likely gone now, his grim secret taken to the grave. And someday, I will be too. But I often wonder if someone else will wander into those badlands, someone who sees the same set of giant tracks, and makes the same foolish mistake I did, following them deeper into the territory of a creature that should not exist. I spent some time last weekend at my buddy's cabin up in the woods of rural Idaho. You guys know Jerome, right? Well, anyway, Jerome's the kind of guy who never leaves the city, but he'd recently inherited this place from an estranged uncle. Some dusty, old cabin on a tiny patch of land in the middle of nowhere. Being Jerome, he wasn't eager to keep it, but he figured he could at least try to flip it for a quick profit. Since I was getting cabin fever and Jerome's a terrible driver, I convinced him to make a road trip out of it and check out the property. We left early Saturday morning, figuring we'd be back late that night. Not a long commute, even with Jerome's white-knuckle driving. If we could find a buyer quickly, we'd even hit a brewery on the way home. Win-win. The road snaked through the mountains, and after a couple of hours, we turned onto a rutted dirt track. The old pickup bounced like a jackhammer, and Jerome cursed nonstop. He kept complaining that the GPS was acting funny, but that felt like his usual excuse for missing the right exits. By the time we found the cabin, it was already mid-afternoon, and that mountain sun was about to set. The cabin itself was... well... It was something out of a horror movie. Rotted wood, busted windows, the whole shebang. Jerome immediately swore he wasn't staying the night, but I pointed out his fear of the dark and reminded him we had nowhere else to go. Now, I don't believe in ghosts or any of that spooky stuff, but even I felt an unease about the place. It wasn't just the disrepair. There was just something off. The woods around us felt too silent, like everything was holding its breath, watching us. All right, all right, let's get this over with, Jerome grunted, finally stepping out of the truck. Even in the fading light, his face was pale and clammy. The front door creaked open like a coffin lid, and we stepped inside. Dust flew into the setting sunlight, thick enough to see. I fumbled with my phone flashlight, but Jerome, for all his city bluster, had already brought a beefy camping lantern. He held it up and we looked around. And yeah, it was as bad as we thought. Holes in the floor, water-stained ceilings, and the faint, musty smell of animal droppings. My guess? Squatters, both the human and furry kind. I'm gonna go scope out the grounds. You secure the perimeter, Jerome instructed in his most serious voice. I rolled my eyes. What are you expecting, Jerome? Axe murderers? A demonic bear? His laughter was too strained, and he was gone. I took a deep breath and started moving from room to room. It was just as dismal everywhere. But here's the thing. Under all the dust and grime, there was something else. Odd marks scratched into the walls, almost like claw marks. And every so often, I swear I'd hear a soft rustling from the ceiling, like something was up there. I made my way to the last room, a small, windowless space at the back. My flashlight cut through the gloom, landing on what looked like a pile of rags in the corner. Wait. Those weren't rags. They were feathers. Big, coarse feathers. My gut twisted. Were there owls squatting here? Eagles? Then I heard it. A hiss. Low and menacing. Not from the ceiling, but from behind me. I froze. My fingers fumbled for my phone, and I spun. 
In the doorway, framed by the fading light, was a creature. No, that's not quite right. It seemed like a creature, hunched and vaguely humanoid, but it was wrong. Too tall, too thin, and its movements were all jerking and unnatural. Its skin... Well, that's the hardest to describe. It seemed to change with every flicker of light. Smooth one second, then scaly, then bristly like fur. And its face, if it had a face, there was just this mottled expanse, almost like unfinished clay. Two dark hollows might have been eyes, but I couldn't tell. My mind froze. I couldn't even scream. This thing twitched towards me, then lunged. It was too fast, too inhuman. I tried to dodge, but my legs were frozen. Something slammed into my shoulder, knocking me against the far wall. I slammed my head into the decaying wood and my vision blurred. The last thing I saw was that impossible shape, its darkness blotted out by a flash of white. Jerome's face popped into view. He was screaming my name. Behind you! He yelled. I scrambled to my feet. Something moved in the doorway, a flash of that weird morphing skin. That thing was still here, and from outside came the sound of crashing branches and what could only have been Jerome bellowing at the top of his lungs. He burst in, holding a busted-up piece of furniture. He swung it like a baseball bat, directly at the creature's head. It shrieked, a bone-chilling sound, and stumbled backwards out the door. Jerome was on it instantly, charging outside, still screaming bloody murder. With a last glance around the room, I took off after him. I wasn't sticking around to find out what that thing was. As we ran for the truck, I heard a final screech, then silence fell over the woods. The truck bounced and rattled like we were on an off-roading safari. Jerome swore like a sailor with a stubbed toe, and my head pounded in time with every bump. I couldn't stop seeing it, that thing. The warped shape, the shifting skin, those whatever it had instead of eyes. My hand shook, and I fumbled for the seatbelt, but of course, the old hunk of junk didn't even have those. What the hell was that thing, man? I finally managed, my voice raspy. Jerome didn't answer. He just stared straight ahead, hands clenched on the wheel. I looked back. The road was just a dirt track fading into the twilight. No sign of anything but trees and the occasional deer bounding into the darkness. Well, what back there? Some rabbit animal? Or a meth head? Jerome finally spoke, his voice low and rough. Never seen anything like that before. It... it wasn't right. We reached the paved road an eternity later, and only then did Jerome relax a little. But that unease didn't go away. It clung to us. The rest of the drive was spent in silence. I tried joking, but my heart wasn't in it. My mind kept returning to the cabin, to those dark pits on the thing's face, like it was looking right through me. That image burned into my brain. It was late when we got back. Jerome looked like he was about to pass out, and I wasn't far behind. He mumbled something about selling the place dirt cheap, finding a buyer who loved fixer-uppers. I didn't care. I just wanted a hot shower and a bed. A normal bed, with actual walls and locks, not whatever nightmares the cabin left me with. That night, I tossed and turned. Every time I drifted off, I saw the creature again, its impossible silhouette. I woke up in a cold sweat, heart pounding like a drum solo, and I knew... That thing wasn't done with us. A few days later, I couldn't shake the feeling. It was like a buzzing in the back of my head, a sixth sense screaming that we were being watched. Jerome wouldn't even talk about going back to the cabin, but that didn't make any difference. I could feel it out there, somewhere in those woods, lurking. I have to go back, I finally told Jerome. The words hung in the air between us. His eyes widened. You're crazy. That thing. We got lucky, man. We got out. But he knew it too. We both did. Whatever that creature was, there was unfinished business between us. 
I could feel it in my bones. So as much as it terrified me, I also knew this wasn't over. We packed the following weekend. Jerome wouldn't come inside, just handed me supplies from the truck flashlights, a first aid kit, and bless him, a couple of hunting rifles. I know it sounds nuts, but I wasn't going out there without a way to protect myself. It took a few hours, that same agonizing drive through the twisting mountain roads. When I pulled up to the cabin, Jerome let out a strangled noise. He waited in the truck, engine running, looking more scared than I'd ever seen him. I stepped inside, my footsteps echoing in the dusty silence. The room where I saw the creature had that same musty smell, like it was waiting. Come out, you freak, I called, forcing my voice to be steady. Come finish what you started. I heard a rustle from above, a sharp clicking that made the hairs on my neck stand up. Slowly, I tilted my head back. In a hole in the ceiling, I caught a glimpse of two dark, hollow eyes. An unnatural snarl echoed down, and then I saw it, descending like a monstrous spider. The creature was even worse than I remembered. Its skin rippled and changed, scales, feathers, then back to that smooth, mottled flesh. It moved on spindly limbs, jerking like a broken puppet. My fear spiked, but then, a surge of anger. My cabin fever turned into raw fury. This wasn't its place. This wasn't okay. I raised the rifle and aimed. My hands shook, but I squeezed the trigger. The sound was deafening in the small room. The creature jerked backwards, screeching. It wasn't dead, but it was wounded. I fired again and heard it clatter away, back into its hole. Silence fell. The dust settled, and the setting sun threw long, orange beams across the floor. It was done. For now, anyway. I walked back to the truck, feeling strangely hollowed out. Jerome looked at me with wide eyes, then just nodded and put the truck in gear. We drove away, neither of us saying a word. We sold the cabin, of course. Took a loss, but who cares? I never went back to those woods. That thing, whatever it was. Well, some things just shouldn't be known. The locals have old legends of some forest spirit. A trickster, they call it. Shapeshifter, malevolent. Said to mess with folks lost in the woods. I don't know if that's what it was, or if the trickster even exists. But that cabin, that place, it's forever tainted. The year was 1995, and I was working as a ranch hand in a remote stretch of Wyoming. Call me Jonas Yellowbird, Oglala, Lakota, by blood. My days were long and hard, but I found a strange sort of contentment out there amidst the empty grassland and rolling hills. It was peaceful in a way city life could never be, you know? The kind of peaceful that seeps into your bones. Still, after six months there... Some days dragged longer than the endless Wyoming fences. That sweltering August, things started going strange on the ranch. The usual stuff, I swore. Tools going missing, misplaced equipment, livestock fences cut. Old man Carter, the ranch owner, blamed it on lazy hands and sloppy work, ranting and raving about his staff. I wasn't so sure, though. It was too clean for human error, too calculated somehow. One night... Something woke me. No sound. Just that gut feeling that something was off. I looked out my little trailer window into the moonlit night. An eerie feeling swept over me like an icy chill. Whatever it was, it was out there. My dog Sadie, a big mutt I'd picked up as a stray, lay at my feet. Usually keen as a hawk, she was whimpering softly in her sleep. Something was spooking her. That's when I saw it. My trailer sat on a little rise, overlooking a large livestock pen a good fifty yards away. In the moonlight, I could make out a figure hunkered down inside the corral. My heart started pounding in my chest. It looked kinda human, but the proportions were all wrong. Too tall. Limbs like gnarled branches, hunched low to the ground. 
I scrambled for my old Winchester rifle. Now I'm no crack shot, but I sure as hell wasn't about to go out there unarmed. I crept towards the window, rifle raised. As I got closer, the stench hit me, a rancid, rotting smell that made me want to retch. The thing was tearing at something, one of Carter's calves, too far gone now to even cry out. It was hunched over it, ripping and gnawing, its long, sinewy limbs moving with jerky, unnatural speed. I felt a surge of fear and revulsion. Then, the creature snapped its head around, eyes gleaming like cold embers in the darkness. They locked onto mine. Now I'm not the fainting type, but this thing, there was something deeply, terrifyingly wrong about it. It was like staring into the face of something that shouldn't exist, a primal predator older than humanity. My finger tightened on the trigger. I aimed held my breath and squeezed. The gunshot echoed through the night, shattering the silence. The creature recoiled and let out a guttural hiss, a sound that crawled under my skin. I expected it to run, to flee. What I didn't expect was its reaction. Its eyes flared, filled with rage, and it charged. It moved like nothing I'd ever seen. It covered the ground in a few inhuman strides, scrambling at the corral fence ripping the wood and metal apart like they were paper. My blood ran cold. I fumbled, firing off another shot, desperate to keep it back. Then I heard Sadie. She'd burst out of the trailer and was streaking towards the pen, barking and growling with insane fury. She was a mix of a dozen breeds, all instinct and loyalty. That mangy mutt was the bravest dog I've ever known. The creature paused, looking at Sadie, calculating. Sadie went for its legs, snapping and tearing at its flesh. It swiped at her, sending her flying, but it gave me a precious moment. I scrambled back inside, slamming the door shut behind me, heart pounding like a war drum. A few minutes later, I heard Carter's truck pull up outside the trailer. I'd radioed him, my voice barely above a whisper, after Sadie went tearing after the creature. That old man came out swinging, Shotgun aimed at the night, yelling like a madman. I poked my head out to find Carter and Sadie staring into the darkness. The corral fence hung in tatters, but the creature was gone. What in the hell? Carter's usually booming voice trailed off, replaced by a sort of stunned silence. He looked from the ruined pen to Sadie, who was bleeding from several gashes but otherwise seemed okay, and then back at me. We gotta talk, kid. His voice was low, grim. Turns out Carter wasn't just a cattleman after all. He was part of an old network. Folks who protected the land from things the rest of the world wouldn't believe, as he put it. He told me stories that night about creatures. Shadowy things that stalked the wilderness, preying on those who wandered too far from the herd. He'd been hunting things like that his whole life, quietly, under the radar, as for that night, he swore he had an idea what that creature was, but wouldn't say another word. In the weeks that followed, things changed at the ranch. Carter and I fixed those fences double strong, patrolled the land, and kept Sadie close. Late at night, when the rest of the hands were asleep, Carter would tell me snippets about what his family called those that walk crooked. I learned they had other names— Names whispered in hushed tones by tribes all over. Wendigo, Skinwalkers. There were more names than I could remember. I left the ranch a few months later, the change in the air too heavy. Even now, all these years later, I still think of that night. The sight of that creature huddled over that calf, its pale, hungry eyes. They say the land remembers, that places hold on to the echoes of the past. The ranch sure felt like it was remembering something evil. I may not have all the answers, but Carter taught me one thing for sure. There's a whole lot of shadows out there in those wild places, some deeper and more dangerous than others. The year was 1983, and I was finally exploring the Gila wilderness in New Mexico. I'd always been drawn to the desert the starkness of it, 
that harsh beauty that either draws you in or repels you. And Gila, with its deep canyons and rugged peaks, is a hiker's paradise if you know what you're doing. I sure did. Or that's what I thought. Folks call me Finn. City life never agreed with me, but out here, alone with my pack and a topo map, well, that's where I feel at home. The first few days were perfect. Scorching sun followed by those ink-black desert nights, the stars like diamonds spilled across the sky. If there was paradise, this was it. Day four is when things went sideways. I'd planned a long loop hike through a canyon system, figured I'd refill my water at a creek halfway and then camp near the head of the canyon. Trouble is, the creek was dried up, bone dry, not even a trickle. Now, I wasn't completely reckless. There were supposed to be a few natural springs further up the canyon, smaller, less reliable, but still marked on the map. That decision, the one to push on and hope I'd find water, that was my first mistake. But hey, I'm stubborn, so off I went. By mid-afternoon, I was getting seriously dehydrated. My head ached, my mouth tasted like sand, and every step on the loose canyon rock was an effort. Then, I stumbled on a set of footprints, not boot prints, barefoot, human, or something that was a close imitation. For a minute, I got a strange, hopeful feeling. Maybe there were locals who knew of a hidden water source, or even another hiker who'd brought extra supplies. My shouts echoed uselessly off the canyon walls. Whoever made those tracks was long gone. I took off after them. Logically, it made no sense. I had no way of knowing if they were going towards a water source or even if they were fresh. Desperation's not exactly known for its rationality. The sun was starting to dip lower in the sky, casting fantastical shadows on the canyon walls when I spotted the person who made those footprints. Up ahead, a figure stood on a ledge, silhouetted against the blazing orange sunset. Too far to see clearly, but tall, even lanky, and definitely no hiker. They were moving in a way that sent a shiver down my spine. Not human, more like... Like an oversized spider scuttling along the rocks. A chill ran through me that had nothing to do with the dipping temperature. That was when I knew... Whatever this thing was, it wasn't friendly. My first instinct was to run, but the canyon here was narrow, sheer walls on either side. Nowhere to go but forward or back, and there was no way I was turning around after coming this far. I crouched behind a boulder, trying to think, trying to form a plan. The figure disappeared from view. Had it spotted me? Or was it just continuing its odd, loping gait? I considered leaving the canyon floor, picking my way up the steep slope, but that would make me completely exposed. The choice was made for me. A shower of gravel rained down from the ledge above me, accompanied by a chittering noise, half bird, half insect, that raised the hair on my neck. I risked a peek around the boulder and saw it. The creature clinging to the rock face about twenty feet above. Its body looked humanish, if a human was stretched out to twice its length, with limbs too long, too thin. Its skin was pale, almost translucent, and on its face... Well, let's just say your average friendly neighborhood squirrel has more human-like features than whatever was perched above me. It cocked its head, staring down with glistening black eyes that gave nothing away. Panic clawed at my throat. I didn't carry a gun, never thought I'd need one out here, but my pack held a good-sized hunting knife. Not much against whatever this thing was, but it was better than nothing. There was a flash of movement from above, too fast to track, before the creature was on the ground right in front of me. My brain barely had time to register the impossible speed before it lunged, I barely managed to block the first blow with my pack, the force sending me stumbling back. The thing snapped at my exposed arm with needle-like teeth, its skin rippling strangely with the effort. I swung wildly with my knife, more out of desperation than strategy. 
It shrieked, a piercing sound that hurt my ears, and scuttled back, holding up a clawed hand. Greenish fluid dripped from a gash on its palm and its eyes burned with fury. I scrambled to my feet. We circled each other, me desperately trying to create some distance, the creature hissing and watching my every move, trying to decide when to strike again. Then, the ground gave way under my feet. The fall didn't last long, more of a tumble into a sandy hollow. Pain exploded in my ankle as I landed, and I swore, knowing I'd sprained it badly, maybe even worse. Before I could get my bearings, the creature was on me. It moved like a blur, its elongated limbs snatching at me, its teeth snapping inches from my face. I lashed out with my knife, more out of blind instinct than anything else, and felt it connect solidly. The creature shrieked again, this time pulling back and cradling a wounded arm. For a moment there was just the harsh sound of our ragged breathing, the stench of its greenish blood heavy in the air. The wound on its arm was already starting to close, the skin writhing and knitting back together with disturbing speed. I'd slowed it down, but not by much. My ankle throbbed in protest. I couldn't run. Yet somehow I knew I wasn't about to become a meal for whatever this thing was. I had one last trick. A Hail Mary of desperation. Years ago, after a particularly nasty encounter with a pissed-off raccoon, I'd picked up a can of extra-strength pepper spray, the kind used for bears, not just angry suburban trash pandas. It was buried somewhere deep in my pack. The creature was stalking towards me, slow, deliberate, like it was savoring the moment before the kill. Every second counted. I yanked my pack open with shaking hands, the world narrowing to the rough fabric and the metallic clink of the pepper spray canister. It lunged just as I ripped the spray free. I had time for a single shot, aimed right into those horrifying black eyes. The spray hissed into the air, and the creature shrieked like a wounded cat, clawing at its face and staggering backwards. I didn't wait to see if it would recover. Scrambling to my feet, I hobbled back into the canyon. Didn't matter where I went, as long as it was away from that thing. The sun was long gone, the canyon shrouded in near darkness. Stumbling, falling, crawling sometimes, I pushed myself on. Behind me, I heard the creature's angry howls, growing fainter as I put distance between us. My ankle was on fire, my lungs burned, my water bottle was dry hours ago. Yet, I moved forward, driven by blind, animal terror. Finally, I collapsed on the canyon floor, too exhausted to even look up. I lay there, gasping for air, listening to my own ragged breaths and the eerie silence of the desert night. They found me the next day. I was semi-delirious, ranting about monsters and spindly creatures that defied logic. The EMTs got me stabilized, and a chopper eventually flew me out of there to the nearest hospital. The official story was simple. Experienced hiker got lost, dehydrated, and took a nasty fall. They put me in a cast and sent me home after a couple of days. I'm not sure if I could have convinced any doctor otherwise, even if I'd wanted to. No way on earth was I talking about those... things in the canyon. I never went back to Gila, not to that corner of it anyway. My ankle healed, though it's still prone to aching after a long day on the trail. I still hike, though less remote trails now. I like knowing there are other folks around, just in case. The desert draws you back, even after you've seen its dark heart. But that primal fear never quite leaves. It sits in the back of my mind, lurking just below the surface. The news reports pop up every few years. Missing hiker, body never recovered. I know the truth others won't accept. Those things I saw. Call them Wendigo, Rake, Skinwalker... Whatever label makes them easier to dismiss, I know they're out there. Survivors. We don't get a club or a support group. We get doubt, condescending looks and dismissive shrugs from those who never saw the darkness up close. Sometimes, late at night, I look at the scars on my arm. 
the teeth marks I bear like a grim trophy. I try to convince myself it was a dream, a delusion, an ugly hallucination brought on by the relentless desert sun. But it doesn't matter if I convince myself or not. The creatures in the Kila wilderness know the truth. I was their prey, and by some miracle, I managed to walk away, for now. My name is Luke Foster, and this happened to me back in 2019. Now I'm not a superstitious man. I've been with the unit for over a decade, seen things that would drive your average person straight into therapy. But there are places that get under your skin, that seep into your bones with a kind of cold dread no monster can quite match. The Pine Barrens is one such place. They call us in when the local law is out of options and the explanations run dry. That's how I ended up with my team in those tangled New Jersey woods. A series of disappearances that made no damn sense. Hikers, sure, that happens everywhere. But there was also a park ranger. Two experienced hunters. Hell, even an entire youth group leader along with five kids just vanished into thin air. My team consisted of me, Jackson, and our newbie, Amelia. Jackson was a seasoned tracker the type who could read Animal Sign like it was a newspaper. Amelia was fresh out of the academy, eager and with a sharp mind, even if her wood smarts were still a work in progress. Me? I'm the skeptic, the one who keeps us grounded, even when the ground seems to shift beneath our feet. We based operations out of an old hunting lodge near the park's edge. The locals weren't exactly welcoming, Folks in the Pine Barrens have a streak of self-reliance a mile wide, and they don't take kindly to government types nosing around. They muttered about the Jersey Devil, old legends given new life by the disappearances, but I wasn't buying it. First few days were a lot of nothing. Same trails crisscrossed over and over. Standard protocol. We searched for signs of struggle, broken branches, anything. What we found made even less sense than people disappearing animal tracks, large canid, but too erratic, and with a stride that was far too long. It was almost like the tracks themselves were stretched. Amelia even swore there were hoof prints mixed in at one point. We sent pictures back to HQ. They ran analysis, results coming back inconclusive. Nothing matched anything in the known database. Whatever was out there... It was defying all known biology. The mood in the lodge grew heavier with each passing day. Jackson got quieter, his usual easy grin replaced by a grim set to his jaw. Amelia was visibly on edge, flinching at every snap of a twig, eyes darting into the shadows. As for me, I was starting to think the locals had a point. Maybe the Jersey Devil was a better theory than what the evidence was hinting at. Then came the break. It wasn't a body, thank God, but a shredded backpack. Belonged to one of the missing hunters. We combed the area meticulously. More of those oversized tracks and a patch of ground. There's no other way to put this. It looked warped. The underbrush was flattened in a weird circular pattern, like something massive and invisible had pressed down on the earth itself. Jackson swore, low and harsh, Amelia just stared, eyes wide as saucers. It was then I felt it, a prickling at the back of my neck, that same instinctive sense of wrongness I'd felt in other places, other hunts gone bad. Something's watching us, I muttered. Jackson nodded grimly. Let's head back, report in. But even as the words left my mouth, I knew it was too late. The change was subtle at first, a shift in the slant of sunlight filtering through the trees, an almost imperceptible change in the quality of the silence. And then, the air itself seemed to thicken, a feeling of pressure, like something vast had shifted into place around us. Amelia let out a small, strangled noise. Her gaze was fixed on a gap between the trees, her rifle raised, hands shaking. Oh my God! What is that? 
and there it was. At first, I couldn't process the sight. It stood unnaturally still, easily ten feet tall, with impossibly broad shoulders and limbs that were too long, tipped with wickedly curved claws. Its skin was leathery, a mottled greenish-brown that blended perfectly with the shadows, its head bulbous and elongated, with eyes that reflected the waning sunlight like polished amber. It was utterly alien, like nothing any of us had ever encountered before. My brain fumbled for references, landing on some half-remembered nature documentary about mantises. But there was an awful intelligence in those eyes, a cold sentience that radiated outwards and hit us like a physical blow. The creature didn't move to attack. It simply watched us, head cocking to the side like some monstrous, curious bird. Amelia screamed something incoherent, a sound of pure terror. And then we were scrambling, scrambling like frightened rabbits as all hell broke loose. I remember the rifle fire, sharp reports echoing through the trees, the creature roaring, a sound so deep and resonant the ground beneath our feet seemed to tremble. Then Jackson was shouting, his voice hoarse, Grenade! There was a blinding flash, a shockwave that knocked me off my feet. Through the ringing in my ears, I heard Amelia scream again, this time in agony, followed by a wet, tearing sound. When I managed to push myself back up, the creature was gone, and so was half of Jackson's leg. I dragged what was left of Jackson out of there, Amelia trailing behind us in a daze, her rifle forgotten on the ground where she'd dropped it. Her shrieks echoed those of the vanished. I don't know how we made it back to the lodge, just a blur of blood and pain and the growing conviction that we were no longer the hunters, but the hunted. Getting Jackson back to the lodge was a nightmare. I'm no medic, no saving lives under pressure hero. Just a guy who tracks monsters and tries not to get himself killed alongside them. Jackson was bleeding bad, lapsing in and out of consciousness, mumbling apologies between choked gasps. Amelia stumbled along beside us in shock, her eyes fixed somewhere a thousand miles away. By the time we reached the lodge, the sun was setting, casting long blood-orange streaks through the trees. I half expected the creature to appear, to step out from the shadows and finish the job, but it didn't. We collapsed inside, locking the doors with trembling hands. There were supplies in the hunting lodge, a decent first aid kit, which I used to bandage Jackson's mangled leg as best I could. He was delirious, muttering about things that burrowed through the earth and a hungry sky. Amelia huddled in a corner, silently rocking back and forth like a broken doll. Every creak of the old floorboards made her flinch. Night fell like a shroud. The silence was deafening, only punctuated by Jackson's ragged breaths and the frantic thumping of my own heart. Every shadow danced monstrously in the flickering firelight. I didn't know if we'd last until morning. We were still alive when the sun crept back over the horizon, but only just. Jackson's fever was spiking, and I was starting to fear infection more than whatever nightmare lurked in those woods. Amelia. There wasn't much left of Amelia. Her eyes had gone blank, staring vacantly into space. My calls for extraction on the satellite phone went unanswered. We were abandoned. That was when the real horror set in. We weren't just trapped here, not with that thing out there. We were forgotten. Cut loose. We'd stumbled onto something so big, so beyond the realm of accepted reality, that the very organization I'd sworn my life to had decided we were better off erased. I considered trying to make a run for it on foot, but where would we go? What could we do with Jackson in his condition, and Amelia a shell of herself? There was nowhere to run, no escape but death, which it seemed would come at the claws of whatever haunted the Pine Barrens. The first subtle signs were the next day. A rustling tremor through the branches of the trees outside, as if something large and unseen was circling. Amelia whimpered, curling further in on herself. 
Jackson's fever-mumbled words morphed from disjointed ramblings to a single whispered name. A name I'd never heard before, guttural and alien. That evening, the lodge went dark. Our generator cut out, plunging us into blackness broken only by the dying embers of the fire. Jackson screamed then, a raw, agonized sound that chilled me to the core. It's here, he gasped. Can't you see it? I swore, fumbling for my flashlight. The weak beam sliced through the darkness, illuminating nothing but the empty room, the dust motes dancing in the air. They're watching us, Amelia shrieked, her voice razor sharp through the tense silence. From all sides, waiting. Jackson was sobbing now, great heaving gasps like a dying animal. I didn't try to calm them, to offer false comfort. What could I say in the face of this monstrous truth? The attack came later that night. Something hit the roof with a force that shook the entire lodge. The wood groaned ominously, and dust rained down from between the beams. There was a rending, splintering sound, followed by a shriek that abruptly cut off. Then came the silence, a silence deeper and more terrifying than before. We knew it was only a matter of time. Jackson was in a merciful coma by then. I cradled his head, whispering reassurances neither of us believed. We'd been reduced to this. A scared man and a broken woman waiting for the axe to fall. But instead of an attack, it was the trees themselves that moved. At first, I thought it was my fear-addled mind playing tricks. But as the pines outside leaned inward, straining towards the lodge... I knew it was horrifyingly real. They bent like reeds in a storm, drawn towards our refuge with unnatural speed. The roof caved in. Splinters flew, moonlight flooding the room as the creature, no, the entity, made itself known. It wasn't solid, at least not how we understand it. It was a writhing mass of translucent tendrils, pulsing with a sickly greenish glow. The air thrummed with its unseen form, a low buzzing that filled my skull until I thought my head would split open. Amelia was gone. I searched desperately in the chaos, but the only sign of her was a smear of blood and a tattered scrap of her jacket snagged on a broken beam. Swallowed, absorbed, whatever the entity did to its victims, it wasn't just killing them. Jackson stirred beside me, eyes wide and filled with soul-deep terror. His fever dream mutterings merged with the buzzing into a hideous symphony, and as the tendrils snaked towards me, I realized with a cold certainty. This was what he'd been seeing. I thought there would be pain, oblivion at the very least, but that wasn't how it happened. One second, I was bracing against the tendrils that flickered through my body like phantom touch. Then, nothing. I awoke outside. The lodge was a pile of rubble. Sunlight dappled through the leaves, mockingly normal. It was as if the whole ordeal had never happened. I waited for the extraction team that never came. No rescue, no explanations, not even an acknowledgement that my team had ever existed. We were erased, wiped away as easily as erasing a name from a list. Now, now I drift. Town to town, odd jobs to keep me in food and cheap motels. Some nights I drink to try to forget, but that never works. Others, I try to piece it together, to rationalize the horror, find a logic to cling to. I've even started my own half-crazed hunts, seeking out sightings of the impossible, desperate for just a glimpse, a sign that I'm not alone in this knowledge. Because that's the worst part, the thing that gnaws at my sanity after all these years. Even if no one remembers them, Jackson and Amelia existed. They were real. And out there somewhere, so is the thing that consumed them. The Pine Barrens weren't just haunted that year. They were the doorway into a vast and horrifying reality that most people never glimpse. And we, we were the unfortunate ones who stumbled across the threshold.
This happened to me on July 7, 2003. I was staying in a cabin deep in the Chattahoochee National Forest, Georgia, figured I'd get some writing done. Enjoy the peace and solitude. My name's Wyatt, by the way. I write when I can. Used to have some short stories published back in the day, but the inspiration hasn't exactly flowed lately. Thought the woods would help change that. It was idyllic at first. Hiking by day, campfire at night, beer, a beat-up old guitar, the usual. One thing I'd always loved was how the night sounds out there are different. Not quiet exactly, but filled with those little rustles and chirps you don't get in the city. Calming in a way. Until they weren't. It started with, well, maybe nothing. A branch snapping louder than it should have. A shadow in the trees that my flashlight couldn't quite catch. I told myself it was deer. Maybe a big raccoon at worst. But my skin started to crawl. Something felt asterisk off asterisk. The next night, I built my fire bigger than usual. Piled the wood high, a beacon against the thick darkness of the forest. But even with the light, I couldn't shake the feeling I was being watched. I tried playing the guitar, but my fingers fumbled on the strings. The old songs didn't sound right beneath those looming trees. Finally, I gave up and headed inside, locking the cabin door with a loud, defiant click. It felt childish, and a part of me knew it wouldn't keep anything out that Asterisk truly Asterisk wanted in. The cabin didn't even have cell service, and the nearest neighbor was miles away. If something happened, I was completely on my own. The night stretched on. I didn't sleep, just lay there listening. Then I heard it. Faint at first, a scratching sound outside the window. My first thought was squirrel, but that faded fast. The scratching became heavy thumps. Something big was bumping against the cabin. I crept from my bed, grabbing a poker from the fireplace. My heart pounded in my chest, a trapped animal roar of adrenaline and fear. Slowly, I eased towards the window, the poker gripped in white-knuckled hands. It was pitch black outside, the moon hidden by thick clouds. But as my eyes adjusted, I saw a shape. Massive. It stood as tall as a man, yet slumped forward, limbs too long. Fur clung in patches to its skin, revealing raw pink flesh streaked with what looked like burns. It was almost skeletal, ribs showing through. The head. That's what made my breath hitch. Not quite dog, not wolf. Something else. Eyes like green coals gleaming from a skull-like snout. It turned its head, and I saw it had teeth. Way too many teeth. Needles crammed into misaligned jaws. It pressed against the window and the glass groaned. Go away! I yelled, the sound weak even to my ears. I slammed the poker against the glass, but it didn't flinch. It let out a noise I'll never forget. Half howl, half something I can only describe as a laugh. And then, the unthinkable happened. The cabin door rattled. The heavy wooden door shook on its hinges, held shut only by the flimsy lock I'd engaged. The creature outside was trying to get in. I reacted without thinking, raced to the back of the cabin, where there was a small window facing the woods. I had to get out. I couldn't stay trapped with that thing. I fumbled with the latch, the sound of it clawing at the door echoing through the cabin. With a desperate shove, the window creaked open. I shoved myself halfway through, my rifle slung on my back, hindering me. My foot caught on the windowsill and I tumbled out, landing hard on the ground. I scrambled up, ignoring the pain. The cabin, the door was splintering. Wood cracked like gunshots as the creature hammered its way inside. I didn't hesitate. I ran. The forest was a nightmare. I stumbled through the undergrowth, branches tearing at my clothes, my bare feet lacerated from unseen roots and rocks. The creature was behind me, its snarls and the destruction it sowed echoing in the night like something out of a horror movie. I thought of those old stories I used to write, the way fictional characters met their gruesome ends. Never thought it would be my story in the making. 
Ahead I saw the lights of a road. Salvation. My lungs burned, every muscle in my body screaming, but I forced myself to sprint. If I could just reach the highway, flag down a car. The trees burst open, and I was there. I skidded to a halt at the edge of the pavement, heart pounding a frantic tattoo. A truck was approaching, its headlights blinding in the darkness. Relief washed over me, an almost hysterical wave that left me weak-kneed. I staggered into the road, waving my arms. The truck driver must have seen me, because the brakes squealed, the whole vehicle shuddering to a halt. I ran to the driver's side, fumbling for words, and then the creature came out of the woods. Headlights shone on its grotesque form, freezing it in mid-stride. The truck driver, a burly guy with a bushy mustache, let out a shout that was part curse, part pure fear. I didn't blame him. The sight would turn anyone's blood cold. The creature didn't hesitate. It launched itself at the truck with shocking speed, landing on the hood with a crash that sent glass flying. Metal warped beneath its claws. The driver was screaming now, a high-pitched wail of terror. I watched, transfixed, as the creature turned its attention towards him. Its head snaked towards the side window. I knew I had to do something. I grabbed my rifle, fumbled it off my shoulder and stumbled for a clear shot. Through the shattered window, I saw the creature reaching for the driver, those horrifying teeth inches from his face. I aimed, took a breath I didn't know I was holding, and fired. The recoil slammed against my shoulder, but the creature let out a roar that drowned out the gunshot. I fired again and again. Blood splattered, and for a moment I hoped. But it didn't fall. The driver was still screaming, still trapped. One more shot, hit it right between its glowing eyes. And finally, it went limp, collapsing onto the hood in a heap. The truck door swung open, and the driver fell out, rolling on the asphalt, shouting incoherently. He scrambled back, eyes wild, staring at the creature on his truck. Somehow, I found my voice. Call 911, I yelled, moving towards the truck cautiously. The driver just gaped at me. The creature didn't twitch. I peered through the shattered glass. It wasn't getting up. I'd done it. It was... I wasn't sure if the word was dead, but it wasn't moving. The police came, of course. It was a surreal blur. Flashing lights, questions I couldn't fully answer, paramedics looking over the driver and me. The truck, with the creature still sprawled across it, was impounded. They even tried to take my rifle, but I put my foot down on that, said I had every right to defend myself, or something. They looked at me like I was crazy. The aftermath? Well, that's a longer tale. The cops called it an animal attack, bear or mountain lion gone feral. Nobody believed my story of what the creature asterisk really asterisk looked like. The driver backed me up at first, but then he recanted, said he hadn't seen anything clearly in the shock. Can't say I blame him. They never found a body, though they did find tracks that didn't match anything known. The case went unsolved. I went back to that cabin once, to grab my things, left the same day. Couldn't shake the feeling I wasn't alone out there. I moved into town after that, a generic apartment with glaring lights and noisy neighbors. Got security cameras, even though I know, deep down, they won't keep things out. Can't look into a shadowy corner without seeing those eyes. Never went back to writing horror. Don't need the inspiration. I write cookbooks now. Recipes, shopping lists the most mundane topics I can imagine. It helps a little. The nightmares come less often. Sometimes, though, I sit and I stare out my window at the street below, and I think about how that road led right into the woods. How many of Asterisk those Asterisk could be out there, hiding in the vast forests no one ever truly explores, and how it's only a matter of time before one finds its way into a city, into the harsh light of day, where nobody will believe what they're seeing until it's far too late. This happened to me a few years back, 
just outside a small town up in the Olympic Mountains. I'm Will, by the way. City-born. Always been more of a coffee shops and streetlights kind of guy. But my girlfriend, Sarah, she's an outdoors woman through and through, a ranger for the National Park Service. That summer, she got stationed at a remote outpost for fire watch season. Figured it'd be a nice change of pace for me, a romantic getaway in the wilderness. Turns out, Nothing kills romance faster than mosquitoes and outhouse duty. The first few days were uneventful, mostly me just trying not to whine too much while Sarah checked her map grids and radioed in reports. But even then, there was this feeling prickling at the back of my neck, like the forest was holding its breath. The quiet was the worst. No birdsong like I was used to, just this heavy, empty silence. Sarah chalked it up to the time of year, but I couldn't shake the sense that something was out there. Then came the noises. At first it was subtle. A twig snapping behind me when I walked to the creek, the rustle of leaves when not even a breeze was stirring. I blamed it on nerves, told myself it was deer or something. Then one night I was alone. Sarah was on an overnight patrol, and I heard it a low, guttural growl right outside the ranger cabin. Every city slicker instinct I had screamed at me to lock the door, barricade myself in, wait for help that felt impossibly far away. But then I remembered the rifle Sarah kept behind the door, the basic training she insisted I get before coming out there. Stealing myself with a kind of dread I didn't know I possessed, I eased the door open and peered into the darkness. The moon was bright, casting long shadows between the trees. That's when I saw it. Huge hunched, covered in coarse fur that gleamed silver in the moonlight. At first my panicked brain shouted, Bear! But then it stood upright, on two legs. Its eyes blazed yellow, fixed on me. I froze. It tilted its head, let out another growl that reverberated deep in my chest. Some small, still rational part of me knew I needed to move, raise the rifle, fire a warning shot maybe, something. But my body was locked in terror. We stayed like that for what felt like forever. Me, the creature, and the awful silence in between. Then, as if deciding I wasn't worth the trouble, it turned and melted back into the darkness. I slammed the door shut fumbled with the locks, then collapsed against the wall, every breath a ragged sob. The next morning, Sarah found me on the floor where I'd fallen asleep, the rifle still clutched in my hands. She didn't question my tear-streaked face and trembling, just made me coffee and gently checked for injuries. When I finally choked out my story, she didn't doubt me for a second. Turned out, she'd heard the whispers around the ranger station. Local legends about a creature in the woods, dismissed as superstition by most, but a few old-timers always exchanged concerned glances when the subject came up. Sarah got me cleaned up, packed our things, and we drove into town to file a report with the head ranger. He was a stern, pragmatic man, not one for flights of fancy. Sarah told him what I saw, her voice steady and official. He didn't interrupt just let out a slow breath when she finished. That was no bear, Mr. James, he said, his voice low. And you're not the first to report such a thing. He pulled out a battered filing cabinet, extracted a stack of folders. Incident reports, missing persons cases, some stretching back decades. The descriptions were consistent with what I'd seen, all eerily similar. They were always filed away as animal attack, predator unidentified. That was the turning point. Wasn't just my crazy story anymore. There was a pattern here, something monstrous haunting those woods. Sarah and I spent the next few weeks digging deeper. We visited the local tribe, seeking out their elders, hoping maybe their history held answers. They listened intently to Sarah's description, a flicker of something like sorrowful recognition in their eyes. One elder spoke, his voice low and weathered. The stories are old, he said. Warnings passed down, 
predator and protector in one, the ones who walk upright but are not men. We left with more questions than answers. Sarah reported everything to her superiors, requested a formal investigation, but the response was frustratingly bureaucratic. The brass wanted hard evidence, a body, something to explain away. They weren't willing to send a team into those woods on the word of rangers and old legends. Sarah and I, we couldn't just walk away. Couldn't go back to normal life knowing what we did, knowing others could be in danger. So, we started our own investigation. We spent our weekends gearing up, poring over maps, practicing our marksmanship. We were outmatched, we knew it. But the thought of doing nothing, of another person vanishing on our watch, was unbearable. One crisp fall morning, we headed back into the woods, armed with our rifles and a grim determination. Our plan was simple. Find tracks, set up motion sensor cameras, do something to prove these creatures weren't just figments of overactive imaginations. And maybe, if we were very lucky, we'd get a clean shot, something that would force the higher-ups to take notice. We followed the old logging trails deeper into the heart of the forest. The silence was back, that same oppressive hush that always sent chills down my spine. We moved slowly, carefully, pausing every few minutes to scan our surroundings. The tension was a living thing between us, thrumming low with each rustle of leaves in the underbrush. Hours passed without any major sign. A few indistinct tracks in the mud that could have belonged to anything, some scat big, but unidentifiable. Discouragement settled in, that familiar worry that we were chasing shadows, that the fear itself was making us see monsters where none existed. Then, just as the sun began to dip below the tree line, we found it. A clearing, not natural, the ground trampled and scarred. And in the center, a carcass deer, or what was left of one, stripped down to the bone and sinew. But the way it was torn apart, it wasn't the clean work of a wolf or a bear. This was brutal, primal violence. Sarah knelt beside it, her ranger's instincts kicking in. She took measurements, photos, careful notes. I stood guard, rifle tight in my hands, heart pounding a frantic rhythm against my ribs. As the shadows deepened, that old, familiar dread closed in, a suffocating certainty that we were being watched. And I was right. A noise from the tree line, the snap of a branch, too loud to be accidental. Sarah and I went back to back, slow pivot to cover all angles. The forest was dim, the shapes of trees blurring together in the fading light. For several tense minutes, nothing happened. Then, a movement just at the edge of vision. It emerged from the undergrowth, massive and impossibly fast considering its bulk. Its fur was a patchwork of grays and browns, thick and matted. Yellow eyes blazed with predatory cunning. One of its forelegs was bent at an unnatural angle, an old injury that didn't seem to slow it down at all. There was no mistaking it this time, no room for panicked misidentifications. This was the creature from the ranger station, the subject of whispered legends, Dogman. It let out a low, menacing growl, bearing teeth that were far too long. Sarah and I raised our rifles as one, the sound of the safeties clicking off echoing through the clearing. The creature hesitated, a flicker of something like caution replacing the raw hunger. But it wasn't retreating. It was sizing us up. My first shot went wide, hands shaking with a mix of terror and adrenaline. Sarah's struck true. The creature roared, a terrible sound that shook the trees. It stumbled back, a spray of dark blood painting the leaves. But the wound, while serious, wasn't enough to take it down. Enraged, it charged. We fired again and again. The sound was deafening in the enclosed clearing, the recoil jarring my shoulder. It was pure chaos. The muzzle flashes, the smell of gunpowder, the snarls of the wounded beast. A bullet creased my arm, sending a jolt of hot pain through me. I lost track of Sarah in the melee, 
saw only the hulking form of the monster in my sights. Then, through the haze, I heard Sarah cry out. Not a shout of warning, but a scream that cut off abruptly. The creature whipped around, my wounded arm forgotten in the new surge of panic. I ran, stumbled towards the sound, the rifle abandoned on the churned-up clearing ground. I found her half-hidden behind a massive old oak, the creature looming over her. Her rifle lay just out of reach. She was gripping her side, blood soaking through her fingers. The creature crouched low, preparing for the final blow, and there wasn't a damn thing I could do to stop it. Then, a flicker of movement in the underbrush, and a second creature burst into the clearing. Smaller, leaner than the first, but every bit as feral. It locked onto the injured dogman with a snarl, launching itself in a blur of fur and teeth. The two creatures became a whirlwind of claws, fangs, and ragged breaths. Sarah and I were forgotten for the moment, collateral damage in a far older battle. I scrambled back for my rifle, but my fingers fumbled with the action, fear making me clumsy. Sarah, bless her, she was always the clear-headed one. She grabbed her fallen rifle, worked the bolt one-handed despite the pain. She took aim, not at the attacking creature, but at the injured one, the immediate threat. Her shot rang out, and the wounded dogman went down with a final gargling cry. The second creature, its focus broken, whirled to face us. My finger tightened around the trigger, waiting for its charge, but the charge never came. It stood, tense, sizing us up for a few heart-stopping moments. Then, slowly, it backed away, dragging the carcass of its kin deeper into the undergrowth. I collapsed beside Sarah, breath ragged and tears streaming down my dust-streaked face. She was pale, losing blood, but alive. Turns out she'd taken a glancing blow, but the wound was manageable with a field dressing and a whole lot of luck. The rest of that night is a blur of adrenaline and exhaustion, bandaging Sarah up, stumbling back to our jeep parked miles away, reporting the incident over a crackling radio. The response was better this time. No more shrugs and dismissals. A body was proof. It was still quietly classified as an unexplained animal attack, but there was a new undercurrent in the official response, a flicker of wary acknowledgement. A team of specialists was brought in, more to appease Sarah's superiors than out of any real hope of finding more of the creatures. The aftermath is a mix of relief and a quiet, gnawing unease. Sarah made a full recovery, but we both quit our jobs. City life feels suffocating now, crowded, but it's a safer kind of suffocating. We bought a little cabin in the foothills, close enough to civilization for comfort, but close enough to the trees to sometimes hear the echo of howls on moonless nights. The specialist didn't find anything out there, of course. Whatever else the dogmen are, they're careful, leaving scant evidence of their passing. Sarah and I, we track the reports online now, the same ones I found after my first encounter. The sightings keep happening, stretching across the country. And on the nights when the wind carries the distant sound of those howls, I can't help but wonder how many more people's lives, like mine, will be forever changed by the shadows in the woods. I moved to Boulder Creek, California a long time ago, almost 15 years, when I was 29. I'm a software engineer, and I was looking for a quiet place to live, a slower life, and a place to unwind. I'm Tarek, by the way. Nice to meet you. Boulder Creek is a tiny town nestled deep in the Santa Cruz Mountains, barely a village. I like the quiet, the woods. I really enjoy spending time outside. It was a Friday afternoon, and I had just finished some freelance work at my place. I needed to head into town to pick up my mail. It's usually a lot of junk, but sometimes you get something good. The general store also has decent coffee, so I thought, why not? I hopped into my trusty old Jeep, and that's where things got weird. Not right away, mind you. It took a little while. 
I was coming down Bear Creek Road heading for town, just taking in the scenery. You know how some places just feel right? Well, this is it for me. Huge redwood trees towering over the road, sunbeams filtering through the leaves, a creek gurgling alongside. Honestly, it's hard to beat the beauty and the quiet. Sometimes you just need nothing around you. Except, lately, something has been not quite right. For a while, I'd been getting a funny feeling, like I was being watched. It started subtly, a brief glimpse of something moving at the edge of my vision, odd noises in the middle of the night, nothing I could put my finger on. But that unease had been growing, and this afternoon, it was starting to gnaw at me. I shook my head, trying to clear it. This was crazy. I was probably just letting the isolation get to my head. But just as I was starting to relax, I saw it. A flash of movement in the trees right along the side of the road. Too big to be a deer and, honestly, not the right shape either. My heart skipped a beat, and not in the good way. I stopped the jeep right in the middle of the road. Thankfully, traffic's basically non-existent out here. I strained my eyes to see into the trees, but whatever it was had vanished. Taking a steadying breath, I told myself I was being stupid. Yet, I couldn't shake the feeling of being spied on. I scanned the surrounding trees again, and then I saw it, further back, a massive shape hunched behind an old redwood. I had never seen anything like this before, not out here anyway. Whatever it was, it looked big and mean. I fumbled for my phone. A shaky picture is better than no evidence at all, right? But as I raised the camera, I swear the thing moved. Not a natural movement, more like it glided a good ten feet back into the trees without making a single sound. I was frozen in place, a chill running down my spine. Then, I heard it. A low growl, just above a whisper, that seemed to come from everywhere at once. That was it. I didn't even try to get the picture. I dropped my phone, slammed the jeep into gear and hit the gas, leaving a cloud of dust behind me. I kept my eyes glued to the rearview mirror, half expecting the thing, whatever it was, to come barreling out of the trees after me. But nothing did. I made it into town in record time and parked in front of the general store. I couldn't stop shaking. My hands clenched so tight around the steering wheel they were starting to ache. I took a few deep breaths trying to calm down, before finally stepping out of the car. Inside, the store was a comforting hub of normalcy. The smell of fresh coffee, old Mrs. Bennett chatting about her prize-winning zucchini, kids laughing over by the candy display. For a second, it felt like everything was right again. Then, I saw Bryn. Bryn's a bit of a local fixture, always up for a chat. She leaned across the counter. You okay there, Tariq? You look like you've seen a ghost. Now, I'm not the type to gossip, but the unease was still riding high. Funny you should say that, Bryn, I replied, trying to keep my voice level. Think I might have just seen something... something weird up on Bear Creek. Her eyes widened in a mixture of alarm and curiosity. Oh yeah? Like what? I hesitated. How do you describe something you can't believe yourself? Well, it was big and fast. And it definitely wasn't a bear or a mountain lion. Her brow furrowed. You know, some folks have been whispering about strange sightings for a while. I didn't think much of it. Figured it was just bored teenagers playing tricks. But you, Tariq. I wasn't liking where this was going. What kind of sightings? What have people been seeing? Bryn looked down, as if searching for the right words. Finally, she said, People say it's enormous. Shaggy gray fur, a snout like a wolf. But it stands on its hind legs, walks like a man. They've been finding odd tracks, too, bigger than any animal around here. My heart sank. That thing in the woods, it matched Bryn's description to a T. I wasn't crazy after all. Suddenly, the coffee didn't seem quite so appealing, and neither did sorting through junk mail. Listen, 
Bryn continued. I know I sound like a loon, but you seem shaken up. Here. She reached under the counter and pulled out a small flask of moonshine. Hair of the dog, so to speak. Maybe it'll settle your nerves. I took the flask with a grateful nod. I could use something to take the edge off right about now. I was about to head back out when I noticed Sheriff Mike by the door, his usual stoic expression laced with concern. Tarek, you here? We've been looking for you. Alden and Kaya went missing yesterday. They went hiking up on Bear Creek Road. My mind started racing. Alden and Kaya were avid hikers, experienced outdoorsy folks. They'd know those woods like the back of their hands. The fact that they were missing didn't bode well. Sheriff Mike saw the look on my face. Something wrong? He fixed me with a serious stare. I hesitated for only a moment before deciding to come clean. I think I saw something up on Bear Creek just now. Something big, not natural. I heard a growl too. It... His eyes widened as he made the connection. That thing folks have been talking about? You think it's got something to do with Alden and Kaya? I didn't know what to think, but a cold certainty was settling in my gut. I don't know, Sheriff, but I can show you where... We followed Sheriff Mike's cruiser back up Bear Creek Road, a knot of dread tightening in my stomach. When we reached the spot where I'd seen the creature, I pointed it out, my voice barely above a whisper. The place had a bad vibe now. Whatever energy had been unsettling before was now thick as molasses, full of menace. Sheriff Mike, along with a few other deputies, scanned the dense woods. Okay, Tariq, stay with me. Let's go on foot, slow and careful-like. Their guns were drawn. It wasn't a comforting sight. Each step forward felt like walking into a trap. The trees loomed silent and accusatory. Leaves crunched under our feet, the only sound in an eerily quiet world. Then I spotted it. A track. Massive. Not an animal I recognized. My blood ran cold. Whatever made that print was way bigger than anything that should be roaming the Santa Cruz Mountains. And then we saw more. Bloodstains. That's when Sheriff Mike stopped and raised a fist. We all froze, every nerve in my body screaming. Whatever was out there was close. It was watching us. And it had done something terrible to Alden and Kaya. A twig snapped up ahead. Something moved. A massive, dark shape darting in and out of the shadows. There! Sheriff Mike shouted, raising his rifle. We fired a volley of shots, the noise echoing unnaturally through the forest. The shots hit their target with a wet thump. I heard a howl, a mix of pain and fury. It shook the very ground beneath our feet. And then silence. Cautiously, we moved towards the spot where the thing had been hit. The bloodstains led deeper into the woods, forming a gruesome trail. Whatever it was, it was big, and it was hurt, but not enough. Not enough to stop it. Dread turned to determination in my gut. It had taken Alden and Kaya, and now it was wounded. We had to track it down. Finish this. We followed the blood trail for what felt like miles over rough terrain, the adrenaline starting to wear off. We found an abandoned shack deep in the woods. The door was off its hinges, wood splintered as if something had forced its way in. There were more blood stains, a lot more. The air inside the shack was rank with the sickly sweet smell of old blood and something foul I couldn't place. I didn't want to find out. It was dark, but even in the dimness, we could see enough. This creature, whatever it was, had dragged Alden and Kaya up here. What was left of them? For a split second, I wished I had stayed in town, had a drink at the saloon instead. And then rage surged through me. That feeling of dread that had been haunting me all these weeks wasn't just fear. It was something primal, hunter or hunted. This thing wasn't just a danger to me. It was a threat to the whole town. If I didn't stop it, who would? With that thought firmly in my head, I drew my own gun. 
Sheriff Mike. I don't think it'll die that easily, I said, my voice raspy and low. He locked eyes with me, and the understanding in his gaze mirrored my own. You thinking what I'm thinking, Tarek? I just nodded. Some threats needed fighting, even the ones you couldn't fully understand. The sheriff gathered his men. All right, we wait for nightfall. Set a trap. We get this thing one way or another. He clapped a hand on my shoulder, a grim look in his eye. You know, son, folks around here, some still whisper stories about the old days, the ones passed down through generations. Back then, these woods had teeth. We may have just gotten ourselves a taste tonight. As the last slivers of daylight disappeared and dusk descended on the forest, the air grew thick with anticipation. The deputies took up positions, forming a perimeter around the cabin. We armed ourselves with heavy firepower and a hell of a lot of determination. Waiting for something awful in the twilight is a special kind of torture. The shadows danced and whispered, making shapes that my fear turned into monsters. Then it appeared, bigger than I ever imagined, easily seven feet tall and impossibly wide, its shaggy fur matted with blood. Its muzzle was long and wolf-like, but those eyes, they held a chilling intelligence. It stalked out of the woods, snarling, a low rumble that shook the ground beneath my feet. They call it something different out here, Skinwalker, maybe. But that's just a name. Some things you just can't give a name to. That's scarier. We opened fire, a storm of bullets ripping into its flesh. It roared in fury but kept coming. And then I saw it. The one shot that mattered. In the split second before it lunged at Sheriff Mike, the moonlight caught its chest. I squeezed the trigger one last time. The bullet tore through its heart. With a final shuddering groan that echoed through the woods, the creature fell, its massive body crashing to the earth. The aftermath wasn't pretty, questioning, cleanup, trying to make sense of the senseless, and the funerals. The whole town felt the loss of Alden and Kaya like a punch to the gut. News crews descended on Boulder Creek for a brief, morbid thrill, then left, but the echoes of that day lingered. Life didn't just snap back to normal. It couldn't. Something had broken. A veil I didn't even know existed torn open. I don't sleep much these days. I still see the thing in nightmares, hear that howl in the empty quiet between midnight and dawn. But sometimes, you walk through darkness to see what lies on the other side. Maybe it ain't so pretty, but at least it's real. The year was 1972, and I was helping out my brother on his ranch near the Ozarks in Missouri. I'm Hota, of the Cherokee Nation, and though it was far from reservation land, we stuck together through thick and thin. My brother, Cajones, he wasn't so much into tradition, always chasing the next big thing, while I liked keeping things simple. Turns out, sometimes simple is what saves your behind. Cajones, with all his get-rich-quick schemes, had gotten in deep with a local land developer, Curtis Webb. This guy Webb, slick suit, slicker smile, was planning to clear a big swath of the Ozarks for a sprawling resort complex. Problem was, that land wasn't just trees and rolling hills. It was old and held a lot of stories, good and bad, nestled down in its hollers. Cajones, though, all he saw was dollar signs, so he'd signed away the ranch to Webb as collateral for some shady loan, basically gambling away his birthright. I pleaded with him, tried to make him see reason, but that land fever had a tight grip on him. Then the accidents started happening. A piece of earth-moving equipment overturned for no reason, its operator barely escaping with his life. Later, workers went out surveying one morning and came back wide-eyed and babbling, swearing they'd seen glowing red eyes in the woods and heard snarls that didn't belong to any known animal. Webb blamed it on faulty equipment or workers trying to sabotage his project, anything except for whatever truly lurked out there. 
One day, I was out mending fences when I found it. A dead doe, torn open, but not eaten. Its eyes were wide with a terror that lingered even in death. Around the carcass, the ground was churned up, and there were footprints I didn't recognize. Big ones, with long, unnatural-looking claws. Something bad was stirring out there, some spirit angry at the desecration of its home. I knew Webb wouldn't listen to reason, not when Prophet was involved, so I kept silent. Best to know your enemy before you face them. It was a few nights later that I saw the footprints again, this time leading right towards the old barn. My stomach clenched. Cahionis was stubborn as a mule, insisted on sleeping out there to protect his investment. I grabbed my hunting rifle, the old teachings of my grandfather thrumming in my blood. The night was quiet, the kind of quiet that prickles the back of your neck. The barn loomed up ahead, casting long, ominous shadows. Moonlight painted the clearing in shades of silver and black. I approached cautiously, rifle raised and senses on high alert. And then I heard it, a low, rumbling growl that vibrated in my chest and the scrape of claws against wood. Cahionis was in trouble. I burst through the barn door, the noise echoing in the sudden silence. The scene that greeted me made the blood run cold in my veins. Cahionis was pinned against the wall by... by a monster. It was wolf-like in shape, but bigger, taller than any natural creature. Its fur was pitch black, and its eyes burned with that same malevolent red glow the workman had described. There was an intelligence in those eyes, a cold, calculating cruelty. With an ear-splitting snarl, it lunged at Cahionis again, but I was faster. I fired the rifle, the sound deafening in the enclosed space. The creature flinched, and a howl of rage echoed off the barn walls. It whirled on me, a blur of claws and fangs. I fired again and again, driving it back step by step, but the bullets didn't seem to phase it much. My heart hammered against my ribs. What the hell was this thing? Then I saw it, its side slick with blood. My first shot had struck true. It wasn't invulnerable, just tougher than anything natural. Cahionis, bless the stubborn fool, wasn't just cowering. He'd grabbed a pitchfork, that desperate gleam in his eye I knew all too well. I aimed again, steadied my breathing. One shot, one chance. The rifle roared. The creature jerked, then snarled and lunged for the open barn door. It disappeared into the night, leaving only the echo of its monstrous howls and the acrid stench of something foul and old. Cajones slumped to the ground, clutching a bleeding gash on his arm. We were lucky to be alive. I bandaged him as best I could, the urgency of the situation finally breaking through the shock. My brother, once so dismissive of my warnings, stared at me with a newfound respect. You were right, he croaked, about the land, about something being out there. He was still pale, and there was the sheen of sweat on his brow, but his eyes held a spark I hadn't seen in a long time. Damn right I was, I said, but there wasn't any I told you so in my voice. This was bigger than sibling rivalry now. We had to warn Webb, stop the development project before it angered this, whatever it was, further. The next morning, we found Webb surveying the area, looking smug and satisfied. When Cajones tried explaining about the attack, the creature, Webb laughed it off, called us fools, threatened to sue for breach of contract. You want a monster, mister? I raised my rifle, not aiming at him, but at the thick tree line. I'll show you a monster. I fired a shot into the woods, the sound exploding the morning quiet, and then silence again, expectant and deadly. For a long, tense moment, nothing happened. Webb scoffed, opened his mouth to no doubt spout more condescending drivel, and then something massive burst from the undergrowth. It was the same creature from the barn, enraged, with bloodlust gleaming in its eyes. The workers scattered, screaming, but Webb froze, his usual arrogance erased, stark terror stamped across his features. The creature, 
fast as a bullet train, covered the distance between the woods and Webb in a matter of seconds. There was a blur of movement, a sickening crunch, and then Webb was gone. Swallowed up in those monstrous jaws, blood painting the ground where he had stood. That single death was enough to break the men. They abandoned their equipment and fled, their cries echoing through the trees. Cahionis and I just stood there, sickened but knowing, deep down, that Webb's fate was on his own head, born from his hubris and greed. This thing, this guardian of the land, it had only defended its home. The chaos was short-lived. The creature didn't pursue the fleeing workers. Instead, it turned its burning gaze directly on me. There was no mistaking the intelligence in its eyes. A primal understanding had passed between us. We were adversaries, yes, but there was a grudging respect there, too. I had wounded it, a testament to both my skill and the fact that it could be hurt. The creature paced back and forth, watching us, as though measuring its options. And then, almost lazily, it turned and vanished back into the trees, melting into the shadows as if it had never been. The sudden silence was a physical force that pushed against us. So, now what? Cajiones whispered, his voice shaking. He looked smaller, all the bluster from earlier drained from him. What indeed? We couldn't stay. This ranch, the land itself, it wasn't ours anymore. It belonged to the creature, the... the Octena. An old Cherokee name for a monstrous serpent surfaced in my memory from childhood stories told around the fire. It fitted what we'd seen, even if those legends never spoke of anything quite this vicious. But what could we do? Fight? The creature had shown its power. Staying was a death sentence. Yet, leaving felt like abandoning an ancient pact, a betrayal of the land itself. The aftermath wasn't clean-cut, not like in a storybook. Officially, Webb was reported as missing, assumed victim of some animal attack. The development plans were scrapped, the workers' tales too outlandish, the single body too little evidence for authorities to justify further investigation. We never spoke about what truly happened. Not to each other, not to the few who asked questions. Some secrets are best kept buried. We left the Ozarks. Cajiones, shaken to his core, became an advocate for environmental causes, his greed replaced by a fervent need to protect what remained untouched. As for me, I returned to the reservation, to the old ways. The incident had awakened something within me. I couldn't erase the memory of the Yuktena, its red eyes, the stench of blood and rot clinging to it, but I could try to understand it. I sought out the tribal elders, those wrinkled repositories of fading knowledge. They listened to my tale, not with disbelief, but with a sober recognition that echoed my own. Over the years that followed, I trained, not as a hunter this time, but as a... negotiator, I suppose. A bridge between the human world and the unseen forces still lingering on the edges. It was a strange path, neither fully warrior nor wholly shaman. There were whispers of the Uktena over the years. Sightings by hikers straying too far from marked trails. Cattle mysteriously killed. Its territory, it seemed, remained confined to the area around the old ranch. Whether that was by choice or limitation, I never learned. Some boundaries, once drawn in blood, are better left undisturbed. I don't regret what happened. Horrifying as it was, the incident brought my brother back from the edge, saved him from the kind of greedy spirit sickness that the Uktena embodied. More importantly, it forced me to confront truths that most choose to ignore, the existence of the old powers still lurking in the forgotten corners of our world. They aren't always malevolent, not inherently, but they are powerful and unpredictable. Like a wildfire, they have their place in the natural order, terrifying, yet necessary for balance. The older I get, the less I see my role as fighting the things that go bump in the night. Sometimes, understanding, or at least a wary truce, is the best we can hope for. 
The Earth is old and holds mysteries humans will never fully comprehend. Learning to coexist with them, however uneasily, might be our only chance at true survival. This happened to me on February 8, 1993. My name's Doug Ellis, and I've been a deputy in the town of Pine Creek, Montana, for almost 10 years. Married, got two kids, Becky and little Tommy, cute as buttons they are. Before Pine Creek, I served in the Marines. Maybe that's why I was drawn to law enforcement, or maybe that's why when everything went to hell, well, you'll see. It all started with the cattle disappearances, a few head missing here and there, nothing too alarming at first. Ranchers chalked it up to coyotes or a mountain lion that had strayed down from the higher elevations. But then the carcasses started turning up, half-eaten, some torn apart in ways no normal predator would do, and always drained of blood, like something out of a Dracula movie. Ranchers started getting spooked. The whispers began, mostly jokingly, about werewolves or Bigfoot gone rogue. I laughed along, but deep down, a cold feeling started worming its way into my gut. Then old man Tucker vanished. Tucker lived way out in the boonies, the kind of stubborn old coot who refused to use a cell phone and liked to brag that he hadn't been to a doctor since the Korean War. When his daughter reported him missing after a few days of not being able to reach him, I figured we'd find him holed up in his cabin, drunk on moonshine and passed out in front of the TV. We found the cabin all right. The door was splintered inward like a bear had busted through it, and inside was a horror scene. The furniture was smashed to pieces, blood was splattered across the walls, the floor, even the ceiling. The whole place reeked of something rotten, like a butcher shop left out in the summer sun. No sign of Tucker, just a single, massive, clawed footprint pressed into the blood-soaked wood floor. Word got out and the whole town went into a tailspin. Folks started double-bolting their doors, arming themselves like they were expecting an invasion. Sheriff Thompson sent in a request for wildlife specialists. He figured maybe we were dealing with some kind of mutated bear, something environmental toxins had driven mad. A plausible theory, if it weren't for the nagging details that didn't fit. The wildlife guys came and went, their thermal imaging trap stayed up for a week, catching nothing but the usual critters. They left shaking their heads, muttering about how they couldn't explain what had happened over at Tucker's place. I started keeping a sawed-off shotgun by my bed, and the nightmares began. A few nights later, I was on patrol along a lonely back road that skirted the base of the mountains. It was close to midnight, snow coming down heavy, the kind of night where anything could be lurking in the white shadows. My radio crackled, and I tensed, thinking it was another report of a missing pet or a spooky noise some anxious resident thought was a monster. Instead, it was Becky Thompson, the sheriff's daughter, and her usual crew of troublemakers out for a joyride, their voices slurred and laughter echoing too loudly over the static. Those idiots, I muttered to myself checking the rearview mirror. Sure enough, I saw headlights weaving erratically behind me. I pulled over, intending to read those kids the riot act, and maybe even haul one of them to the station to sober up. But as the headlights got closer, something felt off. The car, an old, beat-up Chevy, was weaving too much, and it seemed to be going way too fast on the icy road. That's when I saw it. A hulking shape leaped out of the darkness and landed on the hood of the car. It was enormous, bigger than any bear, silhouetted against the swirling snow and headlights. The car swerved, trying to shake whatever it was off, then skidded completely off the road and plowed into a snowdrift. Instincts honed from the Marines and years on the force took over. I grabbed my shotgun, threw the cruiser into park and charged toward the Chevy. I could hear screaming, high-pitched and terrified, cut short by the sound of shattering glass and the guttural snarl of the thing. I reached the car, its headlights still blazing into the snowy darkness. 
the windows were smashed, and the inside was splattered with blood. Becky and one of the boys were gone, dragged out through the broken glass. Of the other two, there wasn't much left to find, and then I turned and saw it, crouched amidst the snow flurries, a monstrous form vaguely familiar yet horrifyingly inhuman all at once. It was at least eight feet tall when it reared up on its hind legs, covered in coarse, matted fur. Its face was stretched and elongated, all teeth and predatory eyes that glowed a sickening yellow. That's when it let loose a blood-chilling howl, a sound that ripped through the night air and sent a primal surge of terror coursing through my veins. I aimed the shotgun and fired, the blast echoing through the night. It roared in pain, a hot spray of blood splattering the snow. Somehow I kept firing, each shot punctuated by its bone-shaking growls. I don't know how many times I pulled the trigger, only that my shotgun finally clicked empty. Wounded, the creature lunged. I barely had time to brace myself before it slammed into me, sending both of us tumbling into the snow. I felt claws rake across my chest, tearing through my jacket and a hot, foul breath wash over my face. Somehow I managed to roll, the snow cushioning my fall but also sending a blinding spray of ice into my eyes. I scrambled to my feet, fumbling for the spare shells in my pocket. The thing was circling me, growling low, its monstrous form moving with terrifying agility despite its injuries. The snow was falling too hard, visibility was crap, and my hands were shaking from the adrenaline and the numbing cold. Then, through the swirling storm, I saw another set of headlights approaching along the lonely road. Salvation. At least that's what I hoped. I raised one hand and waved frantically, my other hand clutching the shotgun and hastily reloading. The car skidded to a stop, the driver's door flung open, and Sheriff Thompson emerged, his expression unreadable. He took in the scene, the wrecked Chevy, the blood staining the snow, and me, disheveled and wild-eyed, standing in the middle of it all. Alice, he shouted, his voice a mix of authority and concern. What in God's name? Behind him, a couple more deputies piled out of the car, their guns drawn, scanning the snowy darkness for the threat. That's when the creature chose to strike. It burst from the veil of snow, charging straight towards the unwitting deputies. There was a flurry of shouts, panicked gunfire, and the echoing roar of the creature in pain. Through the chaos, I caught glimpses of the deputies scrambling back towards the car, trying to escape the beast's relentless attack. Thompson, though, he stood his ground. Using the car door as makeshift cover, he emptied his revolver at the creature. The bullets seemed to have little effect, merely enraging it further. It swatted aside one deputy like a rag doll, then lunged for Thompson, jaws gaping wide. I couldn't just stand there. Reloaded shotgun in hand, I sprinted through the snow towards the sheriff, towards the monstrous form locked in a deadly embrace with him. With a desperate surge of strength, I slammed the stock of my shotgun into the side of the creature's head. It snarled and whipped around, releasing its grip on Thompson and turning its fury on me. I fired point-blank, blasting a hole in its side, the impact momentarily staggering the monstrous thing. It screeched in agony, thrashing and clawing at the air. The other deputies, having scrambled back to their feet, added their gunfire to mine. Still, the creature raged, its strength fueled by a terrifying, unnatural fury. It took a dozen, maybe more shots to finally bring it down. There was a final, shuddering heave of its massive body, then it slumped to the ground, its unnatural yellow eyes fading to a dull, lifeless gray. Silence descended, broken only by our harsh panting and the soft hiss of falling snow. Thompson pushed himself to his feet, a streak of blood dripping down his forehead. The deputies cautiously approached the creature's body, guns still trained on its massive form, ensuring it wasn't playing dead. What the hell? was all Thompson could manage, his voice filled with a mixture of shock and a weary grimness. He looked at me, some unspoken understanding passing between us. 
The aftermath was a whirlwind of disbelief, frantic cover-ups and whispered tales that twisted and expanded with each retelling. The official story was a rabid bear, a freak occurrence driven mad by some unknown toxin. The mutilated bodies in the Chevy, well, they conveniently blamed that on a high-speed collision with a deer, the wild animal story, a plausible explanation for the carnage. The creature, what was left of it, vanished into some government lab, never to be seen again by the eyes of the public. Folks who asked too many questions quickly found themselves the target of disapproving glances and hushed whispers. Pine Creek quieted down, the terror receding into the shadows, life returning to a semblance of normalcy. But some of us, Thompson, the few deputies who faced the creature that night, and me, we know the truth. We formed a silent, unofficial brotherhood, bound by experience none outside our circle could ever understand. Sometimes late at night, I still jolt awake in a cold sweat, the memory of those glowing yellow eyes and the creature's fetid breath seared into my mind. I check the lock on Becky's bedroom door twice, the sight of her sleeping peacefully my only salvation from the terrors lurking in my memory. I still patrol those lonely mountain roads, and on snowy nights, I sometimes imagine the crunch of tires on fresh snow, the distant sound of terrified screams carried on the whistling wind. My hand tightens on the shotgun by my side, ever present, ever ready. You see, the thing about monsters, the truly horrifying ones, is not just their claws and their teeth, it's the knowledge that they exist lurking on the fringes of our understanding. It's the knowledge that there might be more out there, unseen and waiting. And it's the silent, unspoken question that echoes in the stillness of those Montana nights. What if it comes back? This happened to me in 2010. I'd moved up to Alaska after my wife passed, figured the solitude would suit me. Got me a cabin outside of Anchorage, deep in the Chugach Mountains. Name's Harlan, Harlan Scott if you really care. Start was good. Fishing, long hikes, that kind of peace you only find when the nearest neighbor is miles away. But Alaska's got its own kind of quiet. Not peaceful, but like, waiting. It seeps into you makes the hair on your neck prickle. It started with my dog, Samson. Big Shepherd, brave as they come. One night, he just refused to go out, not even for food. Started whining, cowered near the back door. Figured he picked up a scent of a bear or something. Happens. But it became a nightly battle. Never seen him act that way. Then the tracks. Found them behind the woodshed. Big, misshapen, no animal I recognized. Put it down to maybe a mutated moose. Tried to tell myself I was getting spooked over nothing. The dreams came next. Not nightmares, exactly. Just being watched. Feeling a cold, hungry presence right at the edge of my vision. Woke up sweating. The silence of the cabin suddenly feeling heavy, oppressive. One early morning, maybe a week later, Samson let out a bark and bolted into the woods. Figured he finally caught wind of that damn moose. Didn't find hide nor hair of him all day. At dusk, heard a howl cut through the air. Long, mournful, nothing like a wolf. My blood ran cold, because under that howl I heard a whimper, like a dog in pain. Never saw Samson again. Next morning, I went out armed. It was more than finding my dog. It was about ending whatever killed him. Figured that thing wouldn't be too far, full from its feast. Followed the tracks deep into a ravine. Lost them at a stream, like whatever made them just stepped into the water and vanished. Spent the better part of the day scouring that ravine, rifle at the ready. Nothing. Then walking back, movement caught my eye. On the edge of the tree line, there it was. Bigger than I thought hunched over with grayish, mangy fur, humanoid, in a way that made my skin crawl. Head was long, snout stretched out, and those eyes, 
yellow, like dying embers. Took a shot, not sure if I hit it or if it ducked into the trees. Figured cornering it was a fool's errand. Thing knew the terrain, was probably toying with me. Hightailed it back to the cabin. That night, the silence wasn't just quiet, it throbbed. I boarded up windows, checked every latch, loaded the shotgun with buckshot. Tried to tell myself it was my nerves, that I was a grown man scared of shadows. The noise woke me. A scraping, tapping sound like claws on the roof. My heart pounded in my ears. It circled the cabin, the tapping shifting from the roof to the windows, interspersed with a rasping growl that chilled me to the bone. Then, a single gunshot rang out. Silence. Didn't dare hope, but I waited until dawn. Crept outside, and there, sprawled at the foot of a tree, was the creature. Dead. Bullet wound straight between its eyes. Never saw hide nor hair of whoever saved my bacon that night. But let me tell you, I didn't stick around to play host. Packed up what I could carry, drove to the nearest town, and sold the cabin for a pittance. Reckon folks think I'm crazy. Maybe I am. Maybe I imagined the whole damn thing. Grief for my lost dog warping my mind. But when I get that prickle on the back of my neck, when I see those damn yellow eyes in every flicker of shadow, I know it ain't so simple. The sheriff up there found some weird reports over the years. Missing hunters. Livestock torn apart in ways that don't fit any predator they know. Nobody makes the connection. Not in a place with bears and wolverines. But I know better. Heard a story the other day. A hiker gone missing around Denali. That's a ways from the Chugach. But a chill went down my spine all the same. Figure those things move on when the pickings get slim. I keep the shotgun loaded by the door. Mostly, it makes me feel safe. But some nights, I look out at the darkness pressing from the tree line, and I feel that old, primal fear creep up again. A fear that whispers, they ain't done. That thing in the ravine, it wasn't alone. And maybe, just maybe, it's got its hungry eyes on a new hunting ground. My name is Cade Lawson, and this happened to me back in 2014, deep in the heart of Louisiana swamp country. Been doing this job hunting cryptids for the government my whole adult life. Mostly a lot of false alarms and wild goose chases, if I'm being honest. This time was different. This time, the thing hunting us was real. I always liked the swamps. That thick green tangle. The sense of something old and wild lurking just beneath the murky water but this mission felt off from the start. Locals were calling in sightings of a creature they called the Rougarou, some kind of swamp werewolf. My gut told me it was nonsense, but hey, Uncle Sam signs the checks, so in we went. Our team was the standard mix, me, the seasoned vet, then there was Thompson, ex-military, all brawn and bad jokes to cover up the fact that the man was nervous as a rabbit. Michaels was our tech guy, quiet and brilliant. And rounding out the crew was Dr. Acosta, sharp, skeptical, and determined to debunk whatever beast we were supposedly dealing with. We set up camp by a stagnant bayou mosquitoes thick as fog, the whole place dripping with humid heat. First few days were routine, tracking weird prints in the mud, recording odd noises on our equipment. It was almost fun, the way these missions usually went. There was a camaraderie in facing the unknown, a thrill in the hunt, even if it mostly turned up empty in the end. The shift came one moonless night, the air hanging heavy and still. We were huddled by a mess of wires and monitors that Michael swore were picking up something, but the rest of us heard just the buzzing of insects and our own restless shuffling. I was about to call it a night when a low growl echoed through the trees. We froze. That wasn't any animal I'd ever heard. It started low, an almost infrasonic rumble, then built into a guttural snarl that sent shivers down my spine. Michael swore, 
his fingers flying over the keyboard. Whatever it is, it's big, and it's close, he whispered. We scrambled for our weapons. I flicked on my night vision, transforming the swamp into an eerie green tableau of twisted roots and murky water. Something moved in the shadows, a flicker of motion that had Thompson swearing and firing his rifle blindly at the trees. The silence that followed was deafening. Hold your fire, I snapped. We don't want to Christ! A scream tore through the night, a high-pitched screech of terror that ended abruptly with a choking gurgle. It was Thompson. One second he was there, and the next he was gone. Vanished into the darkness with shocking speed. We whipped around, guns raised, the night vision painting the world in that sickly green glow. Nothing. Panic clawed at my throat. I took a shaky breath, trying to think. Something was out there. Something fast, silent, and deadly. Acosta Michaels, back to camp, I barked. Double time. They didn't need telling twice. Our mad scramble back through the swamp was a blur of adrenaline and terror. When we stumbled into the ring of light around our campsite, I did a head count and felt my stomach drop. Michaels was missing. We holed up in his tent, breath ragged in our ears, listening to the symphony of swamp noises that now sounded mocking, predatory. Acosta was trying to reach base, but the signal was dead. I couldn't shake the image of Thompson, swallowed whole by the darkness. Cade, Acosta whispered, her eyes gleaming in the pale light. What the hell is out there? I shook my head, the cold truth seeping into my bones. I don't know, I admitted, the words thick in my mouth, but I think we're not the hunters anymore. Dawn painted the sky a sickly pink, but brought no relief, only confirmation of Michael's fate, his shredded clothes hanging from a tangle of branches, splattered in crimson. There was no point calling for backup now. Whatever we were dealing with was efficient, a hunter honed by the murky depths of the swamp. We were alone, outmatched, and marked as prey. We had one chance, a long shot. Make it back to the extraction point five miles away through the heart of this creature's territory. We packed up what was left of our gear, a grim procession of two haunted, hunted survivors. I moved in front, rifle at the ready, trying to ignore the feeling of eyes boring into my back. Acosta was behind, scanning the trees with a desperate glint in her eyes. We didn't speak. The Swamplands, our usual playground, had turned into an alien battlefield. A twig snapped behind us. I whipped around, my finger squeezing the trigger, but there was nothing there. Just the oppressive silence of the swamp. Cade! Acosta hissed, pointing ahead. There, half shrouded by the mist rising off the water, was a silhouette. Too tall, limbs too long, and hunched over like some twisted parody of a man. Its eyes burned red in the shadows. The Rougarou. It was real. And it was watching us. A surge of primal terror washed over me, stronger than anything I'd ever felt. This wasn't some mangy bear or hoax. This was the embodiment of a nightmare. My brain screamed at me to run, but my feet were rooted to the spot. The creature took a step forward, a low growl rumbling from its throat. My finger tightened on the trigger. This was it. Either we took it down, or we'd end up another smear of red on the brackish water. Fire! I shouted, and the stillness shattered with the crack of gunfire. Acosta and I fired in unison, the sound echoing through the swamp. The creature let out a roar, not of pain, but of pure fury. It charged, a blur of motion, leaping over the tangled roots with impossible speed. My training kicked in. I emptied the rest of my clip, aiming for the hulking form. It stumbled but didn't fall. Those bullets should have at least slowed it down, but the creature seemed barely wounded, just pissed off. Run! I yelled at Acosta, and I didn't have to tell her twice. We bolted, splashing through mud and shallow water, the roar of our pursuer gaining on us. We weren't going to outrun this thing. Desperation clawed at my sanity. 
I threw myself to the ground, rolling behind a thick cypress trunk just as the creature hurtled past, claws slashing uselessly at the ancient bark. It snarled, wheeling back, its red eyes blazing. Acosta wasn't so lucky. Her scream was cut short as the creature snatched her off the muddy path, her shouts dwindling into sickening crunches and wet, tearing noises. The world was a blur of rage and grief. I staggered to my feet, aimed my rifle, and unleashed every last round I had at the creature. I heard the thud of bullets hitting flesh, saw the beast falter, but still, it kept coming. I fumbled for a grenade, the pin falling from numb fingers. I pulled myself up onto the slick roots of the cypress, tossed the grenade in a clumsy arc, and braced myself. The explosion ripped through the humid air, showering me with dirt and swamp water. When the smoke cleared, the creature was gone. All that remained was a blood trail leading back into the depths of the swamp and a gnawing, horrifying silence. Hours later, when the rescue helicopters finally whirred overhead, I was a hollow shell. The extraction team swarmed the area, eyes wide with a mix of disbelief and pity. They treated me with hushed tones and cautious looks, the ones reserved for a man on the brink of falling apart. The aftermath was the usual mess. Debriefings, evaluations, offers of counseling, the government's feeble attempt at putting bandages on wounds that cut to the bone. Acosta and the others were labeled as tragic casualties, their names added to the long list of those lost fighting the unseen. The case was closed, classified, and buried in paperwork and bureaucratic jargon. I left, of course. Took my honorable discharge and walked away from the shadows, from the cryptids and the cover-ups. I tried to rebuild a life. Found a job as a park ranger out in Montana. Big sky country, as far from the swamps as I could get. Sometimes, at night, I can hear the crackle of gunfire in my dreams, followed by Acosta's scream. I'll jolt awake, heart pounding, sweat chilling on my skin. See the Rougarou's blood-red eyes burning in the darkness outside my cabin window, and reach for a rifle that isn't there. See, the thing about monsters is that even when you survive, they never quite leave you alone. Some scars run deeper than flesh wounds, and mine fester in the shadows of my mind. I survived the Louisiana swamp, but a part of me will always remain in that murky water, with the echoes of screams and the stench of blood. I like to believe that thing is still out there, lurking in the uncharted depths, a grim testament to the horrors that hide beneath the surface of our world. Sometimes I think I hear reports whispered on the wind, missing hikers, mutilated cattle, strange sightings in the twilight, and a cold chill runs through me, a mix of fear and a strange, twisted longing. Because I'll tell you a secret that hunters like me learn the hard way. After you stare into the abyss, it stares back. Part of me will always be back in that swamp, crouched behind a cypress tree, waiting for a pair of burning red eyes to emerge from the mist, waiting for a fight I know I won't win. My name's Kellen, and yeah, I guess you could call me an outdoorsy type. Hiking, camping, fishing, all my favorite ways to blow off steam after a long week at the office. This past weekend, I had my sights set on Yellowstone National Park. Always figured it was about time I explored America's first natural wonderland. I decided on a solo, four-day hike covering some of the park's backcountry trails. I'd researched prepped, packed, all the usual safety stuff. I wasn't one of those chuckleheads on the evening news that needed rescuing because they thought they could tackle Everest in flip-flops. Day one was a dream. I set off from a trailhead near Canyon Village, the sun high, birds chirping, that fresh pine scent in the air that makes you feel like you can take on the world. The hike was tough at certain points, but nothing I couldn't handle. That first night, though, things started getting weird. 
I was alone out there. Hadn't seen another soul for hours. But at dinner, I got the distinct impression I wasn't exactly by myself. Now, before you start thinking I've lost my marbles, hear me out. It was just the usual rustlings of leaves, the odd branch snapping, the kind of thing you expect. But I swore I heard footsteps. Heavy, deliberate steps, like something big was pacing around the edge of my campsite. I even caught a whiff of something musky, something I couldn't quite place. It set me on edge. I figured I was just being paranoid, right? I chalked it up to an overactive imagination fueled by too many creepy campfire stories heard as a kid. But still, sleep didn't come easy. I kept seeing movement out of the corner of my eye, shadows flitting between the trees. Day two started with a jolt. When I woke up, there were massive prints in the soft dirt surrounding my tent. Huge. Too big to belong to any animal I knew of in those woods. Black bear, maybe? But something about the shape, the way the toe claws were defined, it didn't fit. I told myself to calm down. Had to be a hoax, someone playing a prank on an out-of-towner. It was ridiculous, but I even questioned if my own boot prints had somehow morphed overnight. But deep down, I knew something was off. Should have bailed right then, but the stubborn side of me wouldn't let it go. Those weird tracks ignited something in me, a morbid sort of curiosity. Besides, I had three days of rations, a sturdy tent, and a good hunting knife just in case. I convinced myself I could handle it, whatever it was. And that's where things went downhill. Each day, those noises, those prints, they got closer always just outside my field of vision, always right on the edge of what I could definitively explain away. On day three, it got worse. I was climbing this ridge for a killer view, had just reached the top when I spotted it. A figure hunched over on the next hill over, silhouetted against the afternoon light. It was too far for details, but I could tell this thing was massive, like seven feet tall, easy, built like a linebacker. It moved with this lumbering, unnatural grace. Then, it whipped its head around, straight at me, as if it knew I was there. I froze. For a heartbeat, its eyes locked with mine, and a chill ran down my spine. Those weren't animal eyes. There was intelligence there. Something calculated, almost predatory. That's when I bolted. I didn't look back until I was clear down the mountainside, my chest heaving my heart pounding a frantic rhythm against my ribs. That night, I didn't bother with cooking. I just stuffed some energy bars in my mouth and burrowed deep into my sleeping bag, the icy tendrils of fear clinging to me tighter than the damp night air. And yeah, I know the smart thing, the logical thing, would have been packing up my things in the morning and getting the hell out of Yellowstone. But there was another part of me, the reckless part, the idiot part, whatever you want to call it. That burned with the need to know what the hell I was dealing with. A part of me figured I had two choices, run and never know what lurked in the shadows of those woods, or face it head on. So, I stayed. I laid a trap, a simple one, really. I set up my motion-activated trail camera on a tree near my camp, loaded it with a fresh memory card, and hoped to catch at least a glimpse of whatever had been shadowing my every move. That night, huddled in my tent, I heard the telltale thud of the camera going off. My pulse quickened. But as exhausted as I was, as much as my brain screamed for sleep, I forced myself to stay awake. I spent the next hours straining my ears, my mind racing through every worst-case scenario, until I heard it. A guttural growl, low and menacing, echoing through the trees. Then came the sound of snapping branches, getting closer, faster. Whatever it was, it was heading straight for me. I fumbled for my knife, my flashlight, my body trembling like a cornered animal. And that's when I saw its shadow cast against the tent wall. It looked like a man, but the proportions were all wrong. The limbs were too long, the torso too hunched, the head too large and bulbous to belong to any human. It circled the tent, snarling, 
its breath steaming in the frigid air. My fingers tightened around the knife, a futile weapon against something so monstrous. A sharp, ripping sound tore through the silence, like claws raking against nylon. My heart pounded in my throat as I realized the creature was trying to shred its way into my tent. Desperation surged through me. I knew I could either cower in terror or go down fighting. Clutching my flashlight, I lunged forward, tearing open the tent flap. The creature recoiled, momentarily startled by the burst of light. I shined the beam directly at its face, and I'll never forget what I saw. Its skin was mottled gray, stretched tight over bulging muscles. The eyes were black pits, devoid of any warmth or humanity. Its teeth were bared in a snarl, elongated canines dripping with saliva. I screamed, a raw, primal yell meant to shock and intimidate. The creature hesitated, a flicker of something like confusion passing through its monstrous features. And that hesitation was all I needed. I broke into a dead sprint, the flashlight bouncing wildly in my hand. It roared in fury behind me, its massive form crashing through the underbrush. I ran like I'd never run before, fueled by pure terror. I barely heard anything over the frantic beating of my heart and the ragged gasps escaping my lungs. Luck, or some stroke of survival instinct, guided my feet. The terrain was rough, the trail obscured by darkness, but somehow I didn't stumble. I didn't fall. Then, a glimmer of hope. The trailhead. I could see the faint outline of my car. I dug deep, finding a last burst of energy to propel myself forward. I fumbled for my keys, my hands shaking so badly I could barely get them in the lock. The car door swung open and I scrambled inside, slamming it shut and locking it just as the creature broke through the tree line. It pounded against the windows, its snarls echoing through the night. I started the engine, the headlights slicing through the darkness and illuminating the beast for a horrifying second. Then I threw the car into reverse and floored it, swerving wildly as I fled the campsite. I drove for what felt like forever, my mind a chaotic mess of adrenaline and disbelief. I stopped only once pulling into a deserted gas station to splash water on my face and try to regain some semblance of composure. I didn't call the cops. Didn't call anyone. Who would believe me? By sunrise, I'd reached the park boundary in relative civilization. Exhausted and shaken, I pulled over to the side of the road and just sat there, staring blankly at the passing cars. The aftermath? Well, that's where things get complicated. I went home, of course, tried to carry on with my life. But you can't see something like that and just forget it. It changes you. I had nightmares for months, always jolting awake with the sound of its snarls ringing in my ears. A therapist suggested I try writing my account of everything that happened to try and make sense of it, and that's when I found them. The old forum posts, the whispers online about other disappearances in the park, other people who claimed to have seen something. Unnatural. It made me feel marginally less insane. I became obsessed, poring over old maps, researching local folklore. The creature I saw? Some people would call it a cryptid. A beast of legend. Others might call it a demon. Me, I don't know the name for it. What I do know is that it's out there, lurking on the fringes of Yellowstone. Some days, I want to round up a posse, gear up and go hunting for the damn thing, put an end to whatever else it might have planned. Then other days, the part of me that values a peaceful night's sleep wins out. Part of me wishes I'd never set foot in Yellowstone, never had my eyes open to the dark reality that hides just beyond the veil of the ordinary. I still love the outdoors, but it's different now. There's always this lingering fear. The knowledge that the world is wilder and far more dangerous than most people would ever dream. I check over my shoulder more often. I sleep with a hunting knife under my pillow. Maybe someday I'll get up the nerve to go back, to try and capture some proof, something solid enough to make the world believe what really lurks out there in the shadows. Or maybe I'll spend the rest of my life looking back, 
forever haunted by that glimpse into the darkness. Honestly, I'm not sure which ending is worse. Back in 1988, I was a hotshot kid fresh out of the academy, assigned to the Navajo Nation Police Force. Thought I'd seen it all, but nothing could have prepared me for what happened out in the canyons of Tsigi. Call me Wakapi. It ain't my real name, but with the kind of things I've seen, you learn to keep certain parts of yourself hidden. Now Tsigi Canyon ain't a place for the faint of heart. It's a maze of red rock and twisted juniper, the kind of place where old stories cling to the shadows. Stories about skinwalkers and other things best left unsaid. Mostly, I dismiss those as tall tales, relics of an older time. Turns out, reality had a way of biting back. It started with some missing cattle. A rancher named Silas Begay reported a couple of his steers vanished in the night, right off his property on the edge of the canyon lands. Found the fence cut clean through, not a trace of blood or struggle. Now, cattle rustling ain't exactly uncommon, but something about this felt off. I questioned Silas, a weathered old Navajo with eyes that had seen a thing or two. We sat on his porch, sipping bitter coffee as he explained that this wasn't his first loss. Over the past few months, he'd been finding carcasses scattered out in the canyons, not butchered, but drained, like all the life had been sucked right out of them. Something ain't right, Silas had said, his voice low. Something's out there, Wikipedia. That evening, with a knot of unease in my gut, I headed out into the canyons. The sun was dipping below the horizon, painting the rock walls in shades of orange and blood red. Shadows stretched long, and the hair on the back of my neck prickled like there were unseen eyes on me. I followed the old cattle trails, flashlight cutting through the gloom, the air was thick with the smell of sage and something else, musky, animalistic. I kept my hand on my service pistol, more out of nerves than any real expectation of needing it. Then I heard it, a rustling sound, like something large moving through the scrub. I froze, heart thudding in my chest. My flashlight beam bounced wildly across the rocks, but I caught a flash of movement just beyond its reach. It was gone as quick as it appeared. I moved forward cautiously, scanning the darkness. Up ahead, there was a break in the rock, a sort of hidden alcove. As I got closer, the stench hit me full force. Rotting meat and something fouler, a smell that sent a shiver of pure revulsion down my spine. My flashlight swept across the alcove, and I nearly choked back a scream. There, Piled in a grotesque heap were the remains of Silas's cattle. Their bodies were shriveled, desiccated, as though every ounce of fluid had been wrung from them. But that wasn't the worst of it. One of the carcasses was moving, twitching, spasming, as if something alive was struggling within the empty husk of skin. That's when I saw it. It slithered out from beneath the pile of dead cattle, a creature as tall as a man, yet gaunt and skeletal. Its skin was taut and pale, stretched over a frame impossibly thin. Its head was hunched low, and as it turned to face me, I saw its eyes. Empty pits, glowing with a sickly yellow light. The creature let out a hiss, a sound that crawled under my skin. Its mouth opened wide, unnaturally wide, revealing rows of needle-like teeth. I swear to this day the damn thing almost smiled at me. Panic surged through me, overriding any semblance of training. I fumbled for my gun, drawing it with shaking hands. I fired off a shot, more of a reflexive jerk than any kind of aim. The bullet slammed into the creature's shoulder, and it jerked back with a screech. But it didn't fall. Didn't even seem hurt. It hissed again, baring those terrible teeth then lunged. I fired again and again, the roar of the gunshots echoing through the canyon. I don't know how many shots hit their mark, but the thing was relentless. It closed the distance with unnatural speed, 
long, skeletal arms reaching out for me. Blind terror propelled me. I dropped the gun, turned and ran. I heard the creature snarling behind me, its clawed feet scrabbling over rock. The canyon walls blurred as I sprinted, breath rasping in my lungs. Up ahead I saw a break in the rocks, a narrow crevice leading out of the alcove. Without thinking, I squeezed through it, scraping my knees and elbows on the rough stone. The thing was too big to follow, and I heard it screech in frustration behind me. I kept running, scrambling through the canyon in the fading light. Finally, I burst onto the main trail, chest heaving. I risked a look back, half expecting the creature to emerge from the shadows. But there was nothing. Just the wind whistling through the rocks. I made it back to my cruiser, hands trembling so bad I could barely get the keys in the ignition. I radioed for backup, voice cracking as I reported what I'd encountered. Of course, the other officers thought I was crazy. Ran into one of those feral dog packs, maybe, they said. Or some junkie out of his mind. No one believed a word about the... thing I'd seen. They never found any trace of the creature out there in Sigi. Not that they looked real hard. And I never saw it again. Though some nights I dream of those empty, glowing eyes. Silas Begay disappeared about a month later. Never found a sign of him. They dismissed me as a rookie who'd spooked himself in the dark, but I knew what I saw. After that night, I became obsessed. I spent every spare hour digging through old reports, scouring local legends and folk tales. It was in the back of the tribal library, tucked away in a dusty old volume of Navajo mythology, that I found it. The Skinwalker. Legend described it as a malevolent witch, capable of transforming into monstrous beasts, but the story seemed mostly concerned with curses and bad luck, not the bloodthirsty creature I'd encountered. Yet, it was the closest thing I had to an answer. And if the legends were even half true, skinwalkers were damn near unkillable. Conventional weapons wouldn't stop the thing, and now it knew I was out there. I confided in an old medicine man out on the reservation, a man named Hostine Yazzie. He listened to my tale, his face etched with a mixture of concern and grim understanding. When I finished, he puffed on a hand-rolled cigarette before finally speaking. There are old ways to fight such things, he said, ways forgotten by most. He explained that skinwalkers were vulnerable to weapons coated in white ash, to rituals steeped in ancient tradition. It was a slim chance, but it was better than nothing. With Hostine Yazi's guidance, I began preparing. The ash ritual took days, meticulous work that left me exhausted but strangely resolute. I modified a few rounds for my revolver, coating the bullets by hand. I knew the old ways weren't a sure thing, but facing that creature again with nothing more than lead felt like suicide. The waiting was the worst part. I kept expecting the creature to come for me, to stalk me in the darkness. Every creak of my floorboards, every rustle in the wind, set my nerves on edge. I barely slept, haunted by nightmares of those hungry yellow eyes. Then, one night, it came. Not for me, though. For Clara Bowlegs, an elderly woman who lived alone out on the edge of the reservation. I got the call on the police radio, a possible animal attack, but I knew in my bones what I'd find out there. When I pulled up to Clara's place, the stench of death hung heavy in the air. Her little cabin was a shambles, the door torn off its hinges. A trail of blood led into the surrounding scrubland. I followed it, flashlight cutting a path through the darkness, my heart lodged in my throat. I found Clara in a clearing, or what was left of her. Her body was mangled, torn, barely recognizable. There were no animal tracks, only the footprints of something far too large, far too human to be natural. And nearby, lurking in the shadows just beyond the reach of my light, I saw the creature. Still impossibly thin, its sickly eyes trained on me with chilling intelligence. Rage boiled up in me, a burning need to avenge Clara, to end this nightmare once and for all. I steadied my aim and fired. The creature shrieked, 
a bone-jarring sound that split the night as the white ash-coated bullet tore through its flesh. It stumbled, hissing in pain, then turned and bolted into the shadows. I pursued, reloading with frantic hands. I could hear it up ahead, crashing through the undergrowth with surprising speed for something so gaunt. Each gunshot pierced the darkness, and each time the creature cried out in pain. I wasn't sure how many shots it would take to bring it down, but I wasn't about to stop. The trail led me back into a secluded canyon, too familiar a canyon. It was the same place where I'd first encountered the beast, the same alcove littered with desiccated cattle carcasses. There was a flicker of movement deeper inside, and I gritted my teeth, pushing through the stench of decay to follow. What I saw in that hidden recess made my blood run cold. There, crouched amidst the bones and shadows, was the creature. It had shed its grotesque skeletal form, transforming into something vaguely human yet utterly wrong. It was Silas Bigay, the missing rancher, or what was left of him. His skin was sallow, stretched over protruding bones, matching the monstrous form I'd hunted. His eyes, those terrible glowing pits, fixed on me with a mix of agony and hatred. Why? He rasped, the voice barely more than a death rattle. I couldn't speak. The revelation hit me like a physical blow. Had the creature somehow infected Silas? Possessed him? Or was this the Skinwalker's true form all along? Silas, the Skinwalker, lunged. I fired, again and again, until the gun clicked empty. Silas collapsed to the ground, riddled with bullets, the light fading from his eyes. As he took his final shuddering breath, his form dissolved, melting into a puddle of viscous, black liquid that seeped into the earth beneath him. The aftermath was a mess of unanswered questions and lingering horror. The official story was a rabid animal attack, a cover-up designed to keep the panic at bay. Clara's death was a tragedy, Silas merely another missing persons case in the vastness of the Navajo Nation. But the truth, the truth was mine to bear. I left the police force shortly after. Couldn't stomach the lies, the half-truths anymore. Took up work as a ranch hand out in a remote stretch of the reservation, where the nights are long and the old stories feel a little too real. Sometimes, when the wind whispers through the canyons, I think I hear a hiss on the breeze and a cold shiver runs down my spine. Because out there in the vastness of the desert, under skies older than time, some legends refuse to die. Okay, so a year ago I decided to try this whole overlanding thing. You know the YouTube videos? Guys in jacked up rigs disappearing out into the wilderness, just them and the open road? Looked like freedom to me, and with remote work booming, figured I could have my adventure and my paycheck too. Best Buy parking lot didn't quite have the same romance, wiring up solar panels for my converted camper. But hey, gotta start somewhere, right? Got the setup dialed after way too many how-to videos, and a couple weeks later, I was pulling out onto I-80, heading west. Now me, I'm not the type for the tourist traps. Zion was too crowded. Yellowstone was all families with strollers and selfie sticks. Blech. I'm looking for the hidden gems, the places nobody seems to talk about. So, when I see this little brown sign pointing to Red Basin National Forest, figure, worth a detour. First few miles ain't much. Dirt road, sagebrush, typical high desert stuff. Place felt deserted, which was just fine by me. Then the road snakes into these hills and suddenly, whoa, rocks like I've never seen. Blood red twisted up in weird shapes, whole cliff faces that look like they're on fire. Definitely not in the brochure if you catch my drift. Place gave me a prickle at the back of my neck, but hey, the scenery. Had to pull over, do the whole Instagram panorama thing. Sun's already starting to dip, throwing long shadows, kind of making the whole scene even trippier. It's while I'm snapping pics, I first hear something in the rocks behind me. 
quick rustle like an animal. But when I spin around, nothing. Figure maybe a lizard, jackrabbit, something small. Get back to my phone, and that's when I notice it. Tracks. Not an animal, not unless it walks on two legs. Too wide, toes too long, and way too far apart. And there's... Claws? My blood goes cold as it clicks. Yeah, this ain't no mountain lion. Whatever made those prints, it's asterisk big asterisk. Now I'm not gonna lie, I hightailed it out of there. Hit the gas, didn't look back till I was back on the interstate. Figured it was probably me freaking myself out. Overactive imagination and all that. Still, took a shower at a rest stop that felt like a week long to wash off the feeling of being watched. Next day, I'm still determined to make the most of this trip. Find a dispersed campsite near Grand Teton, beautiful spot by the river. And that night, first, I hear it again. The rustle in the bushes. The sense of something asterisk out there asterisk. Then, it starts on the RV. First, it's just a thud, low down like something big hitting the side. Then, scratching, slow and heavy, circling all the way around. I'm hunkered down inside, flashlight in one hand, my .45 in the other. I ain't going down without a fight. This ain't no animal, I'm realizing. The way it moves, too deliberate, too smart. And when it stops right by the driver's window, like it's looking in, the hairs on my arm stand up. I see a flash of eyes, a silhouette in the moonlight, tall as a bear, but leaner, limbs too long, all angles and shadow. Then it slams a hand against the glass. The cracks like a gunshot. I don't even think. I squeeze off a round, too, straight through the shattered window. Thing lets out a screech, inhuman, high-pitched, and I can hear it scrambling off into the trees. I sit there, heart pounding, gun still raised for what feels like hours. When I finally work up the nerve to look, there's nothing but darkness and the sound of the river. Cops come in the morning. Local guys used to weird calls from out-of-towners, I guess. Take my statement. Poke around. Find nothing. Figured I was on drugs or just plain making it up. I didn't mention the tracks I'd seen earlier. Didn't mention those eyes at the window because, well, who's gonna believe that? Sold the rig a few months back. The Teton thing shook me worse than I like to admit. Sometimes I think I see movement out of the corner of my eye, late at night, and I'll wake up in a sweat hearing that damn scratching on the windowpane. Friend of mine, ex-ranger named Rory, told me some places ain't meant for folks to stay too long. Said old stories talk about things that hunt the high country, stuff that was there long before us. I ask him, you really buy into that? Rory just shrugs, looks real serious, and says, I seen things I can't explain, things I try hard not to think about. So yeah, maybe those stories ain't far off after all. After that, I decided on a change of scenery, got an efficiency apartment in Miami. Plenty of people, no mountains, and the biggest predators are real estate agents. Not quite the same sense of freedom as the open road, but hey, a guy's gotta sleep at night, right? Although I still double check the locks before going to bed just in case. This happened to me a few years ago when I was working in Alaska. I'm a wildlife photographer. My name's Wilder. Always been a bit of an adrenaline junkie, drawn to remote places and the thrill of capturing elusive creatures. My latest project took me up to the Brooks Range Truly untamed country, grizzly bears, caribou, all the Alaskan staples. But it was the stories of wolves I heard from locals in the tiny outpost towns that really ignited my imagination. I ended up hiring a seasoned bush pilot named Harlan to fly me deep into the mountains. We found an isolated valley ringed by jagged peaks, a winding river glinting in the sun, and no sign of human presence for miles. Perfect. Harlan helped me set up a base camp, a heavy-duty tent, supplies, satellite phone for emergencies, 
then wished me luck and flew off. I spent those first few days just soaking it in. The silence was uncanny, only punctuated by the calls of birds and the rush of the river nearby. I set up camera traps along game trails, hoping for glimpses of wolves, bears, anything that called this place home. Nights were freezing, the stars like diamonds in that clear mountain air. I'd never felt so small, so insignificant in the face of the vastness of the wild. About a week in, things started to feel off. It wasn't the isolation. I thrived on that. This was different. A nagging feeling, like a prickle at the back of my neck. One night, I woke with a start. Sure, I'd heard a howl nearby. But when I poked my head out of the tent, peering into the darkness, there was nothing. Just the wind whistling through the trees. Sleep became impossible. I kept imagining movement out of the corner of my eye. That feeling of being watched intensified. So strong I started to question my own sanity. Then came the tracks. I'd been heading back from checking a camera trap when I saw them in the muddy banks next to the river. Huge paw prints, larger than any dog or bear. It looked like the creature had walked upright. My heart slammed against my ribs. I should have packed up and called Harlan right then. Stupid pride, that need to prove myself, made me stay. The next few days were a blur of intense anxiety. I doubled the number of cameras, barely ventured from my tent unless necessity forced me. Then, one morning, I discovered my camp had been visited in the night. A storage bin was chewed through, food wrappers were scattered, and worst of all, one of my cameras was missing. Whatever was out there had come within feet of my tent while I slept. My hands shook as I packed my gear, muttering curses under my breath. I had to get out. I contacted Harlan on the sat phone. His voice crackled through the static, faint but clear enough. He could be there in three hours if weather held. As I waited, I kept scanning the tree line, rifle in hand. The sound came from behind me a low, guttural growl that made the hair on my arms stand on end. I whirled around, rifle raised, and there it was. At least seven feet tall, it stood silhouetted against the trees. The shape was roughly canine, but its posture was all wrong. It moved with a loping, uneven gait, and those eyes, they glowed pale yellow, reflecting the afternoon light with a chilling intensity. Its muzzle was long, teeth bared in a snarl, and the fur on its massive shoulders stood on end. Terror froze me in place. My finger hovered on the trigger, but there was a disconnect, like my brain couldn't process the impossibility of what I was seeing. The creature took a few slow, deliberate steps towards me. I snapped out of it and fired a warning shot into the air. No reaction. Another shot. Still it advanced, that snarl intensifying. My third shot was a desperate one, and it struck the creature in the shoulder. To my horror, it didn't flinch. No pained cry, no blood. It only seemed to enrage it, and the beast charged, covering the distance with frightening speed. I barely had time to drop my rifle and scramble back towards my tent. The canvas ripped as I dove inside, its claws slashing through the thin wall just inches from my face. I fumbled for a flare striking it desperately as the thing ripped a massive hole in the tent. I shoved the burning flare towards its face. It roared, a blood-chilling sound, and retreated into the trees. I slumped, shaking uncontrollably, sobs racking my body. When Harlan arrived, I was incoherent, pointing at paw prints, shredded tent fabric, babbling about yellow eyes and impossible monsters. He calmed me down, radioed for extraction, and told me I'd probably seen a bear with mange, that they sometimes walked on two legs and the poor lighting could make their eyes look weird. Back in civilization, the nightmares started. Every rustle outside my window, every dog bark, sent me jolting awake, heart pounding. I saw a therapist, and they were kind, told me it was PTSD, a normal reaction to trauma. But deep down, I know that what I saw in that valley was more than a deformed bear. I haven't been back to the Brooks Range, 
and I'm not sure I ever will. Some things aren't meant to be explained. Some corners of the wilderness are meant to remain untouched. Sometimes I dream of those yellow eyes, and the part of me fixated on the truth fights back a terrifying question. Did I escape it, or did it let me go? This happened to me on July 23, 2014 up in the Pacific Northwest. You know the forests there, the deep old ones that swallow you whole. I like it quiet, so I found work fixing up a remote cabin on an overgrown logging property near Mount Rainier National Park. Name's Ezekiel, Ezekiel Dunn. I'm used to solitude, and the pay was decent. Cabin was rougher than I expected, but I was there to work, not vacation. No internet, spotty cell service, the good stuff. Generator ran the lights and power tools, but at night it was just me and the darkness. Now, I'm experienced enough to know that most of the noises out there at night are just critters or the wind playing tricks. You adapt, learn to live with the wild. But this, this was something else. First few nights, everything seemed normal. Then came the sounds like something big circling the cabin after dark and the occasional thump against the old wooden walls. I saw tracks one morning, bigger than any cat or bear print I'd ever encountered. Didn't add up with anything I knew. Found myself doing that thing folks do, dismissing my own senses. Tried to convince myself it was my imagination or some local messing with the new guy. But then I got a good look at the thing. I'd gone into town for supplies, came back that afternoon. As I got out of my truck, I heard a crash from the woods behind the cabin. That's when I saw it, tall, maybe eight feet, crouched near the tree line. Its form was almost human, but not quite. The arms were too long, the shape of its head was wrong, and it moved in an uncanny, jerking way. My blood ran cold. This thing was no bear or hoax. It stared at me. I remember its eyes, a vivid yellow in the deepening twilight, and then it vanished into the forest with astonishing speed, left me shaking there with a truck full of groceries I barely had the strength to haul inside. Spent that night with an axe next to the bed and barricades on the doors and windows. Didn't sleep a wink. At dawn, I found more massive tracks circling the cabin. Something out there was hunting me. I should have left then, driven back to town and never looked back. But I'd already put in too much work, and I wasn't the type to run from something unknown. Instead, I set up a defensive perimeter, rigged makeshift traps around the property, and waited. It came back, two nights later. I was ready this time, shotgun loaded and nerves like steel wires. Heard the sound of the snares I'd set being triggered. A harsh metallic snap echoing through the trees, followed by that guttural roar. It didn't sound angry, more frustrated. The cabin shook as the creature hit the wall, trying to find a way inside. It circled the building, probing for a weakness. My hands were slick with sweat on the shotgun, but I held steady. Through a crack in the curtains, I caught a glimpse of the beast again. This time I got a clearer look. Thick, grayish hide, muscular shoulders, and a head with a blunt muzzle and those glowing eyes. It was both monstrous and strangely familiar, like a predator from some forgotten nightmare. I realized then this thing wasn't some escaped zoo animal or undiscovered species. It was something older, wilder, a creature that belonged to that ancient forest and resented my presence. The assault lasted hours. I fired the shotgun twice, more to scare it off than anything, and the blasts did seem to make it hesitate. When dawn approached, it withdrew for good, leaving deep gouges in the cabin walls and a trail of broken traps in its wake. Next morning, I called in sick, saying it was a bear attack. Didn't mention the rest. Packed up and hauled my gear up to a highway hitched a ride to the nearest bus station, and never returned. Months later, 
I came across an article online about a search and rescue team going missing near Mount Rainier. No bodies were ever found. They blamed it on the rough terrain. A wild animal attack, maybe. But I knew better. I saw more than enough out there to know some things are better left alone. Some corners of the woods where man's not meant to tread. Sometimes, the true horrors aren't what we imagine, but what lurks just beyond the edge of our understanding. Let's just say I don't fix up remote cabins anymore. This happened to me a few years ago. Not that I like to talk about it. I was working as a park ranger out in Glacier National Park, Montana. Beautiful spot, or at least so I thought until all this happened. It was my job to check out all the trails, make sure everything was safe and accessible for hikers. Most of it was easy work, but some of the trails got pretty remote. One morning, I was heading out to do a check on the Bowman Lake Trail. That was one of the more rugged trails in the whole park. Not many people took it, at least not early in the season when I was out there. My buddy Cadell was supposed to be with me, but he called in sick. Figures, right? I hate going out alone, especially into the less populated areas. So, there I was, setting out by myself, headed for the wilderness. At first, it was a pretty normal hike. Great scenery, peaceful, the way it's meant to be, right? But about halfway in, I started to get this uneasy feeling. You know, the kind where the hair on the back of your neck stands up. I stopped to listen, scanned the woods, but... I couldn't find anything specific to be worried about. Figured it was probably just nerves at being out there by myself. The deeper I went into the woods, the stronger this unsettling feeling got. I tried to brush it off, but it was hard. There was this smell. It was strange, hard to place, almost gamey, musky, but with a sickly sweet edge to it that I couldn't identify. About a mile in, I came across something that sent chills down my spine. Some kind of animal carcass, but torn to shreds. The remains were too ragged, not like any predator I knew would leave them. The whole area had this wrongness to it, almost like the air itself was infected. My skin crawled. I should have headed back to the station right then. Instead, I decided to push on a little longer trying to convince myself it was just a fluke, some weird natural occurrence. Bad call. I rounded a bend in the trail and almost stumbled right into something that froze my blood. There, clear as day, was a huge set of tracks. Like, enormous. Nothing like a bear or a mountain lion. They looked almost canine, but way, way bigger. And then I saw the claw marks on a nearby tree, the gashes far too high to have been any animal I'd ever seen. My body reacted before my brain could process what I was seeing. I took off running, heart pounding so hard I thought it might explode. I didn't know what was back there, but I wasn't about to stick around and find out. I raced back the way I'd come, branches whipping me, the stench of that carcass getting stronger with every step. And then, I heard it. Heavy, panting breaths the snap of a twig far behind me. Whatever made those tracks, it was following. Panic kicked in full force. I tore through the underbrush, not caring where I was headed, just away from that thing. But it kept coming, gaining on me. Its breaths were guttural, snorting. Something about the sound wasn't fully animal. As I ran, a clearing came into view. I sprinted for it, desperately hoping that being out in the open would give me some advantage. I burst out of the tree line and then nearly tripped over my own feet. There, in the middle of the clearing, were more tracks, just like the ones I'd seen, and the fresh carcass of a deer ripped apart just like the first. That's when a shadow moved at the far edge of the clearing. I whipped my head around and saw it. Not a bear, not a mountain lion, not anything I recognized. It stood on two legs, easily seven feet tall and covered in dark, coarse fur. Its head was wolf-like, but off, the muzzle too long, 
the teeth too huge, and the eyes. Those eyes were intelligent in a terrifying way, burning into me, pinning me in place. We just stared at each other for what felt like an eternity. Then it dropped onto all fours and charged. I don't know how I even moved. Instinct took over. I lunged to the side as it barreled past, just barely avoiding razor-sharp claws. I stumbled back into the trees, knowing it was only a matter of time before it circled on me again. I ran blindly, the creature's snarls hot on my heels. My mind scrambled for any way out, but I was deep in the wilderness, miles from help. Branches tore at my clothes and skin, but I didn't dare slow down. With a surge of desperation, I spotted it. A river, cutting through the dense forest. Maybe if I could cross lose it on the other side. It was a long shot, but I was out of options. I burst onto the bank, my lungs burning. The creature was close behind, its eyes gleaming like coals as it gained ground. I didn't hesitate. I hurled myself into the icy water. The current was strong, almost dragging me under. I fought with all my strength, gasping for air as I struggled toward the opposite bank. Suddenly, the snarls and crashing stopped. I risked a glance back. The creature was there, on the riverbank, pacing back and forth in a frenzy. It didn't seem able or willing to cross the water. Was I safe? Adrenaline pumping, I reached the other side and staggered into the trees. I kept running, though my body was on the verge of collapse. I didn't stop until I reached a road, where I managed to flag down a passing truck. When park authorities investigated my report, they found no trace of the creature. The carcasses I'd seen were gone, too. They chalked it up to stress, hallucinations brought on by being alone in the wild. The thing is, I know what I saw. They might not believe me, but the memory of those eyes haunts me to this day. Cadell never came back to work. His disappearance was unsolved, and folks whispered that maybe he'd met the same fate as those animals in the woods. Sometimes I wonder if that thing had gotten him. Had it been stalking us both? I never went back to the Bowman Lake Trail. Couldn't even stand to look at a map of the area. I found a new job, something indoors, in a city with lots of people around. The wilderness doesn't feel safe anymore. Sometimes, in the darkest hours of the night, I swear I can still smell that musky, sweet odor. And I hear a low, panting breath right outside my window. The summer of 1992 found me knee-deep in the swamplands of the Okafenoki. It was my tenth year as a park ranger, but the allure of those murky waters never faded. They held secrets, ones that pulled at a part of me I couldn't fully explain. My name's Nathaniel Yellowhorse, and maybe it's the Cherokee blood in my veins, but I've always felt a connection to the old ways, the wisdom hidden in the whisper of the wind and the rustle of leaves. Life near the swamp was simple, which was all any man could really ask for. My days were filled with patrols, tracking the wildlife, and keeping an eye out for the occasional lost hiker. That is, until the disappearances started. The first one, a young couple on vacation, seemed like a tragic accident. They'd wandered off the trail, gotten lost in the maze of cypress knees and alligator holes. Search parties turned up nothing, leaving a knot of dread in the pit of my stomach. Then another hiker vanished, an experienced outdoorsman this time. Folks started talking, the whispers in the local diner getting louder. Some blamed gators, others swore it was just bad luck. But living in those parts, you learn that the swamp has a rhythm to it. This felt different. It was late one afternoon when I found the first clue, a ripped and bloodied backpack snagged on a branch near the water's edge. Inside, the couple's camera, its film ruined by the damp. That's when I saw it. A single, disturbing picture had survived. The image was blurry, half obscured by foliage, but in the center, clear as day, stood a chilling sight. A figure too tall, far too thin, hunched in the shadows, 
Its limbs were grotesquely long, twisted at impossible angles, and its skin looked stretched and translucent, like it was barely holding itself together. It had no real face, just a pair of glowing yellow eyes peering out from a smooth expanse. My blood ran cold. This was no animal. It was something... unnatural. I reported what I'd found to the sheriff, but he just eyed me with weary skepticism. He was a good man, but there were things in this world not even the law could explain. Days bled into sleepless nights. The disappearances continued growing bolder. Fear hung heavy over the townsfolk, emptying the trails I used to patrol in peace. I knew I had to do something. My grandmother would have chanted the old songs, offered tobacco to the spirits, but the old ways were hazy memories from childhood, and out here, it felt like just me against the darkness. One night, fueled by desperation and a healthy dose of fear, I found myself on the edge of the swamp. Moonlight shimmered across the still water, creating an ethereal glow. I didn't have a plan, just an overwhelming sense that I was meant to be here. Taking a deep breath, I stepped into the murky water. Each step was an act of defiance. I was invading its domain, the place where that creature lurked. The humid air clung to me, the buzz of insects a constant drone as I waded deeper into the gloom. Hours seemed to stretch by, but I refused to give in. That's when I heard it. A rustling from the far bank, the snap of a twig underfoot. Every nerve in my body was on fire. I squinted through the darkness, my heart drumming in my ears. And then I saw them. Two pinpricks of yellow light piercing the shadows. The creature. It moved slowly, its gangly limbs making it appear almost comical. But the sense of menace radiating from it was undeniable. A scream built in my throat, but something held me back. It wasn't just fear. It was the chilling realization that this thing studied me calculated my every step. As the distance between us closed, I noticed a putrid smell hanging in the air, one that clung to the back of my throat. It paused a few yards away, as if assessing me. My hand brushed against the cold steel of the revolver at my hip. It seemed useless, a child's weapon against something so ancient and wrong. Suddenly, it lunged. I barely had time to react. It was blindingly fast, its long arms lashing out towards me. I fired a shot out of instinct. The sound cracked through the night air. The creature recoiled, a screech escaping its throat that was more like the shriek of tearing metal than any animal cry. It twisted in on itself, its spindly legs splaying out in impossible angles as it fell backward with a splash into the water. I stumbled back my knees threatening to buckle, my ears ringing from the gun blast. A moment of stunned silence followed. The creature didn't resurface. No ripples disturbed the murky water. Had I actually hurt it? Or worse, killed it? Relief warred with an unsettling sense of dread in my gut. The rest of the night is a blur. I made it back to shore, stumbling through the swamp in a daze, until I collapsed beneath a cypress tree. When dawn broke, I returned to the spot, armed with a search team. We scoured the area, but there was nothing. No body, no blood, no sign of the struggle that had unfolded in the moonlight. They found me half-crazed and babbling about monsters. The sheriff didn't look at me the same way after that, and honestly, I couldn't blame him. I barely believed myself, and yet the image of the creature, its glowing yellow eyes, was burned into my memory. The town branded me as the crazy ranger, the one touched by the swamp fever. I lost my job, and the friends I did have started to distance themselves. It was a lonely existence, living on the fringe of town with only the mournful cry of the herons for company. Sleep became a luxury, my nights haunted by nightmares where the thing with spindly limbs chased me through the labyrinthine waterways. The disappearances, however, stopped. At first, I dared to hope it had been a coincidence. Maybe my wild shot had truly driven it back into the shadows. 
but a nagging doubt persisted. Had I killed it, or merely turned it into something worse? Months turned into years. The swamp remained a constant presence, a watchful eye I couldn't escape. I tried to rebuild my life, taking odd jobs in neighboring towns, keeping my head down. Then one rainy evening, a knock came at my door. It was the sheriff, his face weathered and weary. You were right, Nathaniel, he said, his voice thick with a mix of regret and exhaustion. It's back. A new string of disappearances had started, but this time there was a gruesome twist. The bodies of the victims were being found mangled, their bones twisted at unnatural angles, as if brutally contorted from within. It was the creature's handiwork, a grotesque calling card. The town was ablaze with fear. The sheriff was under pressure, and he, the once stalwart skeptic, had nowhere left to turn. He was desperate, and in that desperation, he saw a glimmer of hope in my crazed ramblings. The next few days were a blur of preparations. I studied old maps and journals, anything that might offer a clue about the creature's nature, its origins. The sheriff gathered a group of trusted hunters, men who knew the swamp just as well as I did. I told them my story, their faces a mixture of skepticism and fear, but they listened, because this time they had no other option. We set out into the swamp at dusk, the oppressive heat giving way to a bone-chilling dampness. The silence was deafening, punctuated only by the croaks of frogs and the distant splash of an alligator. I could feel the creature's eyes on us, watching our progress from the shadows. This time, we were the hunters. Night fell, draping the swamp in inky blackness. We moved in a tight formation, flashlights cutting through the gloom. Hours passed, with nothing but the oppressive silence echoing in our ears. The tension was unbearable, the sense that we were being toyed with hanging thick in the humid air. Suddenly, a scream shattered the night. It came from our rear, followed by a sickening, gurgling sound. We whirled around, our weapons raised. One of our party was gone, vanished into the darkness without a trace. Panic surged through my veins but I forced it down. We couldn't afford to lose our heads now. We pressed on, our flashlights desperately cutting through the gloom. It wasn't long before we found what was left of our missing companion. His body twisted and mangled, left hanging on the low, spiny branches of a cypress tree. Grief and fury mixed inside me. We pushed deeper into the swamp, the creature's presence feeling heavier with each step. Then we saw it. Standing in a small clearing, it was even more horrifying up close. Its papery skin shimmered in the moonlight, the bones visible underneath. It moved with a jerky, inhuman grace, its long limbs twitching like spider legs. And its eyes, those empty, luminous pits of yellow seemed to bore into my soul. One thing was clear. It had changed. It looked stronger bigger, its movements filled with a terrible purpose. This wasn't just a creature of the swamp, this was something infused with darkness and rage. Then, in my mind's eye, the image of its victims, their twisted bodies, flashed before me. The Bonebender. The name whispered through my thoughts. As if sensing my sudden realization, the Bonebender screeched, an unearthly sound that made my skin crawl. The hunters opened fire, their bullets tearing into the night. The creature twisted and danced between the blasts, moving with a speed that defied logic. One by one, the hunters were struck down, their screams echoing through the swamp. Finally, it was just me. I stood my ground, the revolver in my hand feeling pitifully small. I fired until the gun clicked empty. The creature didn't even flinch. And then it was upon me. I felt the cold touch of its long fingers on my skin, a jolt of fear running through me. Just as I thought it was all over, a shot rang out. For a split second, I saw a muzzle flash from behind the cypress trees. Then, 
darkness. I awoke in a haze, the sheriff hunched over me. He had a bandage around his shoulder and looked pale as a ghost. Took the devil down, he croaked. It won't be hurting anyone else. The aftermath is a mix of relief and lingering horror. The disappearances have stopped. The town breathes a collective sigh of relief, even as they mourn the fallen. The sheriff is hailed as a hero, the one who saved them from the monster. No one knows about my part in it, and I'm content to let it stay that way. Some nights, I still wake up in a cold sweat, the image of the bone bender seared into my memory. I still venture into the swamp, not as a ranger, but as a lone sentinel. Because in my heart, I know that the darkness of those murky waters holds secrets far more terrible than we can comprehend, and evil, once rooted, is not so easily vanquished. It was 1978. I was a high schooler living on the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota, working a summer job at the Tribal Forestry Service. They called me Jake Little Elk, though some of my non-Lakota friends from school tried to shorten it to Jakey. They got the stink eye for their trouble. One sweltering July weekend, my supervisor asked me and a couple of the other older guys, all Lakota, to clear some brush near a remote stretch of land bordering the Badlands National Park. We loaded up an old pickup with chainsaws and axes and headed out, the dry air shimmering above the sun-baked prairie. We got to work, the buzz of the saws and the rhythmic thud of axes filling the morning silence. That's when I saw it, a flicker of movement out of the corner of my eye. Something big and dark was slinking just beyond the trees, it moved unnaturally low to the ground, its shape shifting and indistinct in the heat haze. The other guys were still focused on their work, oblivious. Unease prickled at the back of my neck. Now that I looked, I could see tracks in the dust near the tree line, prints far too large for any dog or coyote. Hey, I said, lowering my axe. Y'all seen something move over there? The other two, Ben and Pete, looked over. Where? Ben asked. I pointed, but the tracks were the only thing visible. Guess it was nothing. My voice trailed off. I could feel it watching us, could feel the wrongness lurking in the shadows. We went back to work, but I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. Every creak of branches in the wind made me jump. You're being paranoid, city boy, Pete joked, slapping me on the back. Maybe he was right. Still, I couldn't relax. Around lunchtime, Ben let out a startled curse. What the? He was pointing at one of the tires on the pickup. It was slashed open, the rubber hanging in ragged strips. Sabotage? A bear attack? Either way, we were stranded. Well, hell, Pete said, surveying the damage. Guess we're walking. Great. A long hike back to headquarters, under the burning sun and in the presence of whatever lurked in the shadows. It was just past noon now, the sun climbing higher in the cloudless sky. We set off, me deliberately lagging behind. I kept glancing over my shoulder, expecting to see a pair of glowing eyes fixed on us. A couple of hours in, we came across the remains of a deer carcass, half eaten, the exposed bones picked clean. The sight made my stomach churn, we walked faster, the silence broken only by the crunch of our boots on dry earth. Ben stopped abruptly. Look! He pointed to a set of faint footprints skirting the edge of the path. I froze. These were human-shaped, but way too big. Maybe it's a park ranger? Pete sounded desperate. My grandfather had told me stories long ago. Stories of things out there that weren't quite human. Things to be feared. Could it be a... A skinwalker? My hands trembled. I thought of my grandfather, of his weathered face, of the warnings he'd given me. We gotta warn the others back at headquarters, I said urgently, about the truck and something else is out here. Ben and Pete exchanged a worried look. 
You think it's... Ben trailed off, not wanting to say the word out loud. I nodded. I don't know for sure, but better safe than sorry, right? We pushed on, fear spurring us faster now. The sun was beginning to dip below the horizon when we saw the comforting sight of the Forestry Service headquarters. A handful of our co-workers were gathered out front. I felt a surge of relief. As we got closer, I realized something was wrong. They were all armed, their faces grim. What's going on? I asked, breathless. One of them, a guy named Tom, stepped forward. His eyes were bloodshot. There's been an accident, he said, his voice strained. Pete, your brother. He went out to fix a fence this morning. Never came back. A wave of nausea washed over me. Pete let out a strangled cry, the words I couldn't say tearing from his lips. The skinwalker. Tom looked at me, his eyes widening. You saw it too? The rest of the men fell silent, their eyes filled with a chilling mix of fear and resignation. We're going out at first light, Tom said, his voice now edged with steely determination. To find your brother. To find that... that thing. I didn't sleep that night. Instead, I cleaned my old hunting rifle, my hands steady and cold, every movement deliberate. Beside me, Ben tossed and turned, haunted by nightmares. His brother, my teammate, we might have to face the thing that killed him. At dawn, we gathered outside. Myself, Ben, Tom, and four others, all of us hardened by life on the reservation, all of us now touched by a primal fear. We wore thick, heavy clothing, hoping it might offer some protection. I was loaded down with my rifle and enough supplies for a few days. This might not be a quick hunt. We followed the creature's oversized tracks. They led straight towards the Badlands, a stark, eroded landscape of cliffs and ravines, a perfect hiding place for something that wanted to disappear. Hours turned into a full day of relentless tracking. The trail twisted through dry ravines and up crumbling slopes. We found nothing but the occasional half-eaten rabbit carcass. The sun beat down, my sweat mingling with the ever-present dust. Maybe it's gone, Ben whispered, more in hope than conviction. I shook my head. The air hung heavy, the silence unnatural. Whatever it was... It knew we were coming, and it was waiting for us. Just before sunset, the tracks led to a narrow, shadowy gorge. The others hesitated, sensing the danger. Pete never made it out of here, Ben said, his voice low and strained. We don't have to... I looked at him, saw the grief and terror in his eyes. We could go back, report a missing person, let the police handle it. But deep down, we all knew they'd find nothing but questions, just like with the others who disappeared in these parts over the years. This was on us. Pete would come for me, I said, my voice surprisingly steady. We owe him this. Tom nodded grimly. We go in together, and we go in armed. We edged into the gorge, rifles raised. The shadows pressed in the silence broken only by the rasp of our breath. I scanned the rock faces, expecting an ambush at any moment. The tracks vanished halfway down the gorge. Then, a noise, like rocks tumbling. We froze, then whirled towards the sound. Above us, on the rim of the gorge, stood a figure, tall, hunched, its features hidden in the gathering dusk. Pete! Ben cried out in desperate hope. The figure turned. No, not Pete. It was something unnatural. Its skin was taut against its bones, its face twisted into a hideous parody of a human. But its eyes, they burned with a cold, malevolent intelligence that made my blood run cold. Naga, I gasped. My grandfather's stories. The name surfaced like a half-forgotten nightmare. A spirit eater a devourer of souls. The others exchanged terrified glances. It was one thing to hear the old tales, another to face the monstrous reality. 
the creature let out a piercing shriek, a sound that echoed through the gorge and seemed to tear at my sanity. It crouched, preparing to spring. Then, a flash of fur, a streak of brown launching at the naga from above. A mountain lion. It sunk its teeth into the naga's shoulder. The naga howled, thrashing. It tried to grab the cat, but the mountain lion was too quick, darting out of reach. We didn't hesitate. We fired. The gorge erupted with gunfire. The naga screamed again, not in triumph, but in pain and rage. It stumbled, then turned and fled, scrabbling up the canyon wall with unnatural agility. The mountain lion, wounded but alive, bounded to safety. It watched the fleeing naga, let out a low growl, and then disappeared. It saved us, I whispered, disbelief welling up. Tom shook his head. No, it was protecting its territory. Silence settled over the gorge. We finally emerged from the deepening shadows. I thought of Pete's mangled body, of the other vanished ones, and knew there would be no happy ending to this. Still, we'd done something. We hadn't turned away. We hadn't been devoured. Back at headquarters, we made a report. Missing person. Possible wild animal attack. Nobody would believe the truth, and maybe that was for the best. Some truths are meant for the shadows. In the years that followed, I went away to college, got a job off the reservation. But something changed in me that day. When I look into the darkness now, I see the Naga's burning eyes. I smell the stink of death. I feel the echo of that chilling shriek. The old stories, the things that walk in the shadows, they're not just tales told to scare children. There are creatures that lurk on the edge of our world, and sometimes they cross the line. Maybe Pete is out there in the Badlands, his soul lost to the Spirit Eater. Maybe Ben is right, and it's better not to know, not to see too deeply into the darkness. Maybe but I'll keep my rifle loaded and my eyes wide open, just in case. Because the fight in that desolate gorge wasn't the end. I have this terrible feeling. It was just the beginning. My name is Ezekiel Barnes, and this happened to me on February 25th, 2008. Married two kids, mortgaged the usual middle-class American life. Well, mostly usual. My other job, the one that pays for the house and the minivan, that one isn't exactly advertised on LinkedIn. See, I'm part of a government task force that specializes in, well, let's call them unusual threats. The things that make the news a sanitized mess of bear attacks and unexplained disappearances... You'd scoff if I told you what really stalks those shadows. But you wouldn't be laughing for long. Got called in after a string of killings up in Vermont, near the Canadian border. Cold country. Deep woods. The kind of places people underestimate. Locals reported the bodies ripped apart like a wild animal. But way bigger. We flew in. A small team with me, Reynolds, and Pierce. Reynolds was ex-military, all business and built like a brick wall. Pierce, the youngest, was our tech expert and resident skeptic. Me? I'm the vet. Been in the field for years. Seen enough to know that sometimes fairy tales have fangs. We tracked the trail for days, found torn-up deer carcasses, and a campsite wrecked like a giant had thrown a tantrum. Tension hung in the air thick as the winter fog. It wasn't long before it all went sideways. We'd split up, me and Pierce on one trail, Reynolds on the higher ground for better sight lines. It was getting dark, that strange twilight hour where the woods turn from hushed green to hungry black. Pierce started swearing about his thermal reader going wonky. Then I heard it. A growl so low it rattled in my chest. Not a bear. Something old. Something barreled out of the dusk, a blur of muscle and fury. It slammed into Pierce, knocking him down hard. A blur of teeth, the wet rip of fabric, and a scream that cut through the trees. I fumbled for my rifle trying to get a clear shot, 
but the damn thing was fast, monstrously fast. It circled, stalked, always just out of reach, its eyes gleaming in the dark like embers. Reynolds shouted into the comms, something garbled with static. Then a gunshot, another roar, and an ear-splitting shriek. We heard him yell, then silence. The creature turned, its gaze fixing on me. It was... wrong. Bulkier than any bear I'd seen, with skin stretched tight over bone. Its head misshapen, a maw full of jagged teeth, like broken glass. I took a breath and fired, shot after shot echoing in the desolate twilight. It snarled, staggered, and seemed to flicker for a moment like a glitching TV screen. Then it lunged, and I scrambled backward, my boot catching on a root. I slammed down, the creature landing on my legs. Its claws sliced down my thigh, searing pain cutting through the adrenaline. I got a shot off point blank, and the world exploded in the stink of burnt fur. The creature shuddered, then was gone, vanished into the gloom with a strangled hiss. My leg throbbed like fire. Somehow I hauled myself up, calling for Pierce, Reynolds, hoping to God they'd answer. Nothing. Only the desolate trees and the gathering dark. The woods here whisper secrets older than us, tales of blood and hunger. And as I limped towards the rendezvous, my radio dead and a trail of scarlet dripping behind me, I knew one thing. Reynolds and Pierce. They weren't coming back. They were gone, swallowed by the woods. That night, the woods won, and tomorrow I'd be back to finish the damn job. But some hunts, you never really walk away from those hunts whole.